begin and welcome to the 168th meeting of the New York State Board for Historic Preservation. And as always, we will begin with the roll call. Okay, so Bob Mackay. Here. Jennifer Lamack. Here. Doug Pirelli. Here. Daryl Andrades. Here. Paul Stewart. Here. Chuck Vandry. Here. Tom Mag. Here. Wayne Goodman. Here. Kristen Heron. Here. J.D. Lorenzo. Here. I'm listening, I've got somebody on here twice. Everybody? I, everybody? And of course, we're without our wind today, unfortunately. So, um, Tom, you'll have to fly solo. Wait, I'm sure the and I can't go back. Basically, the Mid Hudson Valley is returning down there, and that's just like the tick, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like the deer tick. Um, I'd like to introduce um, anybody who didn't read him, Rob Hildebrandt, our new executive De deputy commissioner. Is that your title, Rob? Hello, everyone. Hey. Um, and He's here today representing Commissioner Rose Hubbard. Oh, yes. That's what she said. Yeah, so um, we, uh, approval of the March minutes. Did we have a, a motion to approve the March minutes? I move. Doug moves. Second. Okay. Bill seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Now we move on to uh, staff reports. Um, do you want to talk about meetings? Next meeting first, or that's uh, what I can have. Can we say? Can we save that? Yep. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's start at the top. Rob, I think has a letter to to read to us. I do. I have. Uh, letter that I'd like to read from Commissioner Harvey, who was uh, unable to be here today. She's uh, otherwise engaged in the state of New Jersey today, but uh, so she was uh, not able to make it here for this. And it is a special day, and she sends her, she sends her regrets, and I would like to read a letter uh, from the commissioner to uh, our outgoing chair, Mr. McKay. Dear Bob, on behalf of of the staff of the New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. I extend my profound thanks for your two decades of service as chair of the New York State Board for Historic Preservation. You have been rightly recognized for many notable achievements in creatively <coughs> and effectively advocating Long Island's cultural heritage. I want you to know how much I appreciate the work you've done to retain, promote, and reuse our architectural heritage all across New York State. Thanks in no small part to your leadership, New York State leads the nation in the number of national register sites. And historic preservation is increasingly seen as an effective community revitalization strategy. It's a testament to the fact that the board's ambition has been balanced by clear-eyed pragmatism. Your legacy as State Review Board Chair will live on for many years to come in so many of the special places you've helped to recognize and document, defend and champion wonderful places that enrich communities across the state. I wish you a fulfilling retirement. I hope that your days include a healthy dose of sailing, but that you still have time for visiting, writing about, and saving the places that are worthy of saving. Please note that we at the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation will continue to look to the example you set during your unrivaled tenure as chair. You will be greatly missed. Sincerely, Rose Harvey, Commissioner, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Well, thank you, Rob. I have, uh, I have one other announcement that I'll make on behalf of the commissioner. Um, we are pleased to uh, announce the appointment of Daniel McKay as the deputy commissioner for historic preservation, and Dan, Daniel will be joining us, uh, I believe the date is July 24th. Uh, he's known to many of you already, and uh, we look forward to uh, having him join us and serve as deputy commissioner. I just want to say, no relation, but a really good guy. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pronounced differently for some reason. Yes, spelled the same. McKay, not McKay, spelled the same, and it is Daniel. Uh, he, he prefers Daniel. He, uh, he'll accept Dan, but never Danny. 
<laughs> um, so we look forward to having, having Daniel join us uh, later this summer. And I'd also just like to uh, give our thanks to Michael, who's been serving double duty in, uh, in a big ways since uh, December when Ruth departed. Michael, thank you very much for your service you. and everything that you've done. It's easy working with this group. So I guess that's a transition to my brief report. I want to report out on three things. Uh, one, directly affecting the board, uh, you are aware that a number of people have uh, either re resigned from the board or their terms expired and they haven't uh, rejoined the board. Uh, we're in the process with the appointments office of appointing three new board members to the board. <clears throat> we certainly hope to have them on board by the September meeting. Both Paul and Wayne's terms expired and they are being reappointed and at Bob's departure and long-awaited replacement Doug Pirelli has been uh, nominated to be the uh, new chair and that's going through the appointments process as well so thank you to those of you who have been serving and are stepping up and I'll introduce you to the new ones in September Absolutely. hopefully Two other things that I'm deeply involved in on behalf of the commissioner. One is the women's suffrage centennial this year. With Jennifer's help, we are circulating two sets of interpretive panels on New York's passage of women's suffrage in 1917, the centennial being this year. All summer long, we have six panels from the State Museum exhibit up at Lorenzo, which oddly enough was an anti-suffrage place, but that's there's two sides to the story. And then we have another set of panels <coughs> excuse me, panels traveling around the state to different state historic sites and that schedule is posted on our website so if you're interested you can figure out where you want to go to see that so Jennifer was very helpful in that regard she offered us the first panel and when I asked for a second she said absolutely so thank you Jennifer <laughs> and the other thing that I'm working on is the World War One Centennial Commission it's not a celebration it's a something Anyway, the report is due to the Assembly, Senate, and the Governor by the end of the month, so if you don't see me for the next three weeks, that's what I'm doing. That's it for, for us. The staff will fill you in on anything else they've been doing. Great. I, have, I want to introduce... Go ahead. Uh, I would like to introduce to you one very essential staff person that you haven't met yet, Sean Heaton. Would you stand up? Sean is um, a GIS tech who has been working with Mike Schifferly to um, improve the quality of our existing NR data and what that means is he's going back into um, the old, old nomination forms and trying to map them in CRIS and when <laughs> Sean comes to us and says the nomination says it's a 250 acre estate somebody's drawn a wild circle on a map and he wants to know how he should plot it in Chris and we just go like this <laughs> because it involves somebody who doesn't hasn't worked here and is possibly not even alive and we have to try to read that person's mind what they might have intended to nominate. Swan's our hero uh, because we were trying to put these nominations uh, onto real Real land. So, um, just want to introduce Sean and thank him because he's really, and he's very also nice and even tempered, and he doesn't <laughs> throw anything at us. Okay. So, I guess we're ready to begin then. Okay. So, um, yeah, I want to just explain, and I want to have Nancy and Doug maybe introduce this too. Um, unfortunately, our guests from the Seneca Nation were not able to make it because one of them had emergency surgery and the others, well, one of them was, was his wife, and the other two were reluctant to come without him. Um, so we debated a long time yesterday what to do, but we finally, Doug called them and they said they'd like us to present it anyway so that they could go ahead and send it to the keeper. Um, you don't review this because they have their own preservation officer, but they've asked for your, they've asked for you to present it, and then Michael would sign it as a um, um, what I consulting, you are? consulting, consulting officer or something like that. And that is the shipbo. Um, 
So, and then we might ask them to come back later at the next meeting or in December or something to speak to you and maybe be honored. So, Nancy, would you stand up because you, and Nancy? It looks like she doesn't want to. I already <laughs> talked to her about it, yeah, yeah. Maybe Nancy and Doug, if you would just talk to us about your work with the Senecas and what you hope for with this nomination. But you have to stand up, Nancy, because you speak lightly. I'm the Native American liaison for the ship, oh, so I've worked with the Seneca Nation of Indians for about the last 10 years, but generally I work with them under um, our Section 1409 and Section 106 laws, which are our regulatory laws. And under these laws, generally what the SHPO does is uh, works to make connections between the various consulting parties and ensures that all the participants have, an, have a voice in the process. And it's, it's gratifying to be able to facilitate historic preservation above and beyond compliance by assisting um, an Indian nation through the National Register process. So um, this is only the second time in 15 years that I've worked with an Indian nation. Um, so this is exciting. Hopefully it happens more frequently. And it's our hope that we can continue to strengthen our historic preservation partnerships with Indian nations and other underrepresented communities to diversify the National Register. So. And I think this is the beginning of more interaction with the Seneca Nation in terms of National Register nominations. They recognize that they don't have to come to this meeting and present the nomination form, that they can go directly to the National Park Service, but they wanted to participate and bring this nomination forward like other ones have been brought forward to participate in the process and introduce themselves and this project to a, a larger historic preservation community. Okay, so Jen, um, have you I just want to mention, um, I've been working with them for about two and a half years on this, um, developing a, a nomination draft. Um, I found this one of the most interesting stories to tell throughout this process, so I'm, I'm really excited. I'm sorry they couldn't be here to share in this, um, but, but I'm really excited to present this information, which I think is such a valuable story for, for our New York State history. So. Um, so the Allegheny Council House is significant for its associations with two major 20th century events in the cultural and governmental history of the Seneca Nation. The Allegheny Council House served as the primary gathering place for regular meetings of the Seneca Council beginning in 1926. Over the next 40 years, the Allegheny Council House functioned as the governmental center for the Seneca Nation. During this time, the battle was uh, the building was the socio-political epicenter for two major, nearly simultaneous Seneca Nation battles to halt the Kinsua Dam project and to obtain the right to vote for Seneca women. Between 1936 and 1966, the Allegheny Council House served as the primary location where the Seneca Nation discussed, debated, and formulated strategies to prevent the U.S. government from taking 10,000 acres of treaty-protected Seneca lands along the Allegheny River. After a lengthy and ultimately unsuccessful legal battle to protect their lands in the mid-20th century, one-third of the Allegheny Reservation land was flooded by the Kinsua Dam beginning in 1966. As a result, the Seneca people suffered the taking, loss, and destruction of ancestral hunting, fishing, and gathering areas, farms, homes, churches, schools, the ceremonial longhouse and burial grounds, and the forced relocation of over 600 people. While creating deep emotional and psychological wounds that last to this day, the resistance to the Kinsua Dam that occurred at the Allegheny Council House ultimately strengthened Seneca determination to protect their sovereignty, helped to create a new generation of activists who have been instrumental in creating numerous educational and economic opportunities for the nation, and advanced the suffrage movement of Seneca women. The first record of Seneca women seeking the right to vote in nation elections occurred at the Council House in 1935. Although the first attempt was unsuccessful, it was during the Kinsua Dam controversy that Seneca women staffed committees, testified be before the U.S. Congress, and helped organize the removal. It was the women's participation and strong leadership role in the fight against the dam that, that finally influenced the male-dominated leadership to grant women the right to vote and hold office in the Seneca Nation. And in 1964, in this building, Seneca women were given the right to vote. 
The Allegheny Council House is one of the few surviving public buildings from this era remaining on the Seneca Reservation, and it was, a and it, it was the political and social nucleus of activity for these historic events, both of which continue to impact the Seneca Nation today. For its role as a central meeting place for the Seneca Nation during this pivotal era in their governmental and cultural history, the Allegheny Council House meets the requirements for Criterion A in the areas of politics, government, and ethnic heritage Native American. While the building was initially constructed around 1925-26 to serve as the new primary administrative center for the nation, its significance in this context really begins in 1935 with the earliest recorded vote taking place to give the Seneca the women the right to vote and ends in 1966 when the Kinsua Dam was completed and government functions transferred out of this building to the new Haley Building nearby. So this era really encompasses the period during which the building is most strongly associated uh, for the events for which it is significant. Historically, the ancestral homeland of the Seneca people was located in the area between the Genesee River and Canandaigua Lake in New York State. The Seneca are one of six tribes united under the six nations of the Haudenosaunee, also known as the Iroquois, a, a historically powerful Northeast Native American confederacy. Formed around 1450, the six nations of the Iroquois each maintained their own cultural practices and traditions while living in separate areas of the state. While the Seneca Nation lived in this region for several centuries, interest in the area grew among European missionaries, traders, and soldiers beginning in the 1700s. Rising tensions between the Seneca and the encroaching white settlers occurred during the late 1780s and early 1790s. Also known as the Treaty of Canandaigua, the Pickering Treaty of 1794 was the result of this attempt to find peace between the Six Nations and the United States government. Signed on November 11, 1794, the Pickering Treaty contains the signatures of 50 sachems and chiefs representing the Grand Council of the Six Nations of the Iroquois Confederacy and of several U.S. government officials, including President George Washington, whose signature was signed on a piece of paper stitched to the bottom, which ratified the treaty. Uh, his signature is shown there. So the document outlined terms for the future rights to maintain and purchase property henceforth. Despite the conditions of the Pickering Treaty, land issues continue to arise between the U.S. government and the Six Nations throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. In 1794, for instance, the Treaty of Big Tree was signed, creating the Allegheny Reservation and several other reservations in New York State. By the provisions of this treaty, the Seneca relinquished their rights to nearly all of their traditional homeland in New York State, except for 12 small tracts of land for $100,000 to New York State. Historically, the land composing the Allegheny Reservation was essential to the physical, cultural, and social well-being of the Seneca. In many ways, life on the Allegheny Reservation was intricately tied to the land. Families settled along the river, where they planted their crops, hunted animals, fished on the rivers, and collected fruits and herbs. Access to the river and its fertile soil was essential for the Seneca, who depended on these natural resources for physical sustenance. This land served as far more, as, far, far more than simply a source of food and supplies, and it also played an important role in the spiritual traditions of the Seneca. The Allegheny River and its surrounding valley provided the primary source for continuity within the spiritual system. Culturally, this strong, multifaceted relationship to the land and the river also created settlement patterns that impacted social relations. In the 19th century, families tended to settle along the river, which you can see in this map, um, rather than in clustered towns, each using the land surrounding their homes for their own agricultural subsistence. This created social relationships that afforded families a degree of independence from one another, all bounded by their mutual use and respect for the land on which they resided. So the United States federal and state governments expressed interest in constructing, constructing a dam on the Allegheny River early in the 20th century. The project, led by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, was first considered as a method of flood control on the river in 1928. Flood control was a major concern during the 20s and 30s when several storms in western Pennsylvania caused record flooding and significant damage to the Pittsburgh metropolitan areas. In 1936, the Kinswood Dam was proposed as part of the Flood Control Act, which was authorized by Congress in 1938. These preliminary plans called for seizing several thousand acres of Seneca territory along the river in order to construct and operate the dam to regulate flooding. The dam was to be located near the town of Warren, Pennsylvania, but it would affect the Allegheny River upstream to a great degree, particularly the area of the Allegheny Reservation. Considerable opposition from the Seneca Nation arose at this time. Shortly after the project was proposed, however, it was tabled as the government focused on its attention on foreign policy during World War II. 
1956, the project reemerged as a vitally important con uh, as vitally important on the construction agenda of the federal government when record floods on the Allegheny and Ohio rivers greatly revived public interest in building the Kinsua Dam. Support for the project came from many downstream residents in New York, Pennsylvania, but primarily from businessmen uh, and industrialists around Pittsburgh. Once interest in constructing the Kinsua Dam was revived after World War II, a series of swift legislative actions on behalf of the U.S. government systematically suppressed the Seneca Nation opposition to the project on multiple occasions. For each action that the Seneca Nation took to protest, reverse, or compromise the Kinsua Dam project, the U.S. government dealt another blow to the community at both the state and federal levels. On January 11, 1957, the U.S. District Court of the Western District of New York upheld the government's right to condemn land of the Seneca Nation for the proposed project. Ten days later, the U.S. Court of Appeals denied a petition from the Seneca for a stay of the order of condemnation and possession of the land. Under pressure from the Seneca Nation and its legal representatives, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers agreed to have an independent engineering firm develop an alternative plan for providing flood control on the Allegheny River without disrupting Seneca land. With assistance from the Quakers, the Seneca hired Arthur E. Morgan to lead the study to find an alternative site for the dam. Morgan, the planner and chairman of the Tennessee Valley Authority, had worked on the Norris Dam and several other pro projects as part of the TVA system in the 1930s. Morgan identified an alternative proposal that routes the Allegheny River into a large glacial depression with three times the capacity and at a reduced cost to the Army Corps proposal. However, it would impact and relocate some non-Native American citizens. The Army Corps of Engineers rejected the Morgan Plan with little explanation. During this time, the Allegheny Council House became the, cup, the hub of political activity for the Seneca Nation, where they met regularly in order to enact di diverse strategies to fight the construction of the dam. The Seneca continued to take legal actions against the Kinsua Dam, seeking recourse in courts at the state and federal level. The earliest record of a Kinsua Dam-related meeting that took place in the Allegheny Council House was listed in meetings from October 17th 1959, although it is likely that conversations about the project started much earlier. At the October 1959 meeting at the Council House, a special session of the Council voted to retain Arthur K. Lazarus Jr. as their general counsel and attorney for the Kinsua Dam litigation negotiations or settlements. The Pickering Treaty of 1794 was vital to their case, wherein it argued that the seizure of Seneca lands to construct the Kinsua Dam was in direct violation of the conditions of the treaty. Signed by George Washington himself, the Pickering Treaty served as the crux of the legal battle between the Seneca Nation and the U.S. government. Advocates on behalf of the Seneca, advocating on behalf of the Seneca, Lazarus and the legal team attempted to uphold the conditions of this document, which stated in 1794, quote, the United States will never claim the same land, nor disturb the Seneca Nation, nor any of the six nations, in the free use and enjoyment thereof but it shall remain theirs until they choose to sell the same to the people of the United States who have the right to purchase. The legal team referenced the Pickering Treaty at the crux of the case, arguing that the US government had broken the conditions of this historic peace treaty. In response to this prolonged battle, however, every court from the federal district to the US Supreme Court denied their petitions, as one historian phrased it. In 1959, opposition from the Seneca Nation caused, caused the U.S. Congress to freeze appropriated money to be used for the Kinsua Dam in order to await pending court action. This victory was only temporary, however, as the Supreme Court refused the, the Seneca Nation motion later that same year. This Supreme Court action removed the last legal obstacle for the U.S. government to construct the dam. Despite efforts to stop it, construction of the Kinsua Dam officially began on October 22, 1960. Newspapers reported thousands in attendance at the groundbreaking ceremony, and the event soon drew national media attention. Articles in the New York Times, New Yorker, and Evening Post covered the legal battle in detail, while opinion pieces advocating for the Seneca began to appear in a variety of general, general circulation magazines, as well as in pop culture. Music icon Johnny Cash, for instance, included a song devoted to the subject on his album Bitter Tears. In the song, As Long As The Grass Shall Grow, Cash described the situation with regret, and it is suggestive of the swell of contemporary popular support for the Seneca that came from outside the community and outside the region. Even as the construction of the Kinsua Dam was underway, the Seneca Nation continued to gather at the Allegheny Council House to further mobilize in an attempt to terminate the project. In 1961, they sent a request to the White House to halt construction on the dam, which President John F. Kennedy uh, personally denied while citing the immediate need for flood control. 
In 1962, the Seneca government increased its meeting schedule from twice a year to once a month, indicating the sense of urgency and determination they felt in response to the Kinswood Dam. In the Allegheny River Basin, official council meetings were almost always held at the Allegheny Council House, which was increasingly occupied by activists, officials, and concerned citizens in the days leading up to and during the construction of the dam. Acknowledging that the project may not be halted and that relocation may be inevitable, focus shifted to planning for relocation. A committee known as the Kinzua Planning Committee regularly met at the Allegheny Council House in order to organize for the potential relocation of their entire community upon completion of the dam. In 1964, recognizing that the federal government was not going to halt the project despite a multitude of legal actions, the Seneca shifted their activist efforts to securing compensation for the last loss of their land in some form. Well, no monetary value could possibly compare with the emotional, social, and historic impact of the seizure of this land, the Seneca sought compensation in order to ease the physical relocation of the community to a new area with new buildings and new land. The federal government took nearly 10,000 acres of Seneca land, approximately one-third of the entire reservation, forcing the relocation of over 650 residents. In an attempt to assist the Seneca with relocation, the government set aside 305 acres of land for their relocation split between two towns along the Allegheny River, Steenburg and Jimerson Town. While they received some financial compensation from the government to assist with the relocation, the move was sudden, difficult, and somewhat disorganized. As one scholar revealed, many Senecas had only two months from the time they received the money to the time they had to move. In a process entirely foreign to the Seneca way of life, family cho families chose the lots for their new homes through a lottery on the reservation. The Seneca were also forced to adapt to new settlement patterns, being resettled in new suburban style developments, condensing a community that had previously coexisted on 10,000 acres into 305 acres and weakening the traditional relationships between families and land use. Shortly after the relocation, the majority of the buildings and structures in the old reservation were destroyed. Much of the acreage in the take area was the most important land to the Seneca, including a number of ancestral homes, farms, and, and the communities of Red House and Cold Spring. Several sacred sites were also destroyed on the former re reservation, causing great disruption in the spiritual community as well. The demolition of the Cold Spring Longhouse, once the ceremonial center of Seneca traditional life, was particularly traumatic to the spiritual life of the Seneca. Additionally, over 3,000 graves, including that of Seneca religious leader Handsome Lake, were removed from their original locations during and after the construction of the dam. One Seneca elder, Sally Crow, discussed the impacts of the move with an interviewer over 20 years later in 1988. This is her quote. When it became true and they were going to move us, I told them I wasn't going to move, that I was going to stay right here. They said that my property would be flooded. I said, I'm staying right here. Well, after we moved here to the relocation site, it didn't feel like home. Even now, it feels like I'm just visiting. They burned our old house down, and I think that land has been underwater only once. When my husband used to get home from work, we'd go back to the old place and sit there until late at night. We used to have about 10 acres. Now we have three acres, more or less. It's been 16 years since we were moved. We had no choice but to move. They said it was progress. In addition to this pivotal role in the Seneca resistance to the Kinswood Dam, the Allegheny Council House played an important role in the Seneca Nation's women's suffrage movement. While Seneca women did not gain the right to vote until the mid-20th century, the history of Seneca women's pursuit of suffrage traces back to the 19th century. Throughout the early 1800s, the Seneca Nation was mostly a matrilineal society, but this pattern was substantially changed in 1848 with the creation of the Seneca Nations of Indians at the Allegheny and Cattaraugus Reservations, and it had the, the effect of disenfranchising women in the community for the next century. However, during the Kinswood Dam meetings and conversations, Seneca women took a more active vocal role in community leadership, bringing their plight to suffrage to the forefront. According to one historian, the first record of Seneca women seeking the right to vote in nation elections occurred at the regular session of council on December 4, 1935 at the Allegheny Council House. The issue officially resurfaced in 1955 when a motion was made to entertain the petition made by women of the Seneca Nation who sought to vote and hold office, and again in June 1956 when the meetings indicated that the council called on a chairperson of the women's suffrage organization that it formed. The motion was defeated by 30 votes on May 11, 1959, but, then, but again for a third time in 1962, losing by just two votes in Cattaraugus and ten votes at the Allegheny Council House. In March 1964, Seneca female activist Martha Falamang 
uh, presented a petition containing 162 signatures requesting the right to vote uh, right to vote to council. In doing so, she pledged to, to wage an all-out campaign to win the vote, telling council, I have been turned down before, but turning me down is like picking me up. On May 23rd, 1964, the men of the council finally granted Suf Seneca women the right to vote, approving the amendment by 169 to 99 at the Allegheny Council House. About six months later, in November 1964, Seneca women voted in their first general election at the council house. Enabled to vote, but not yet to hold political office, Seneca women continued to petition for this right until 1966 when they won by a narrow margin. So the repercussions of the Kintzua Dam era continue to, to be felt throughout Seneca society today, and the project has fundamentally changed the familial, spiritual, and governmental relations in the community. Two decades after the Kinzua Dam was completed, the Seneca Nation initiated a ceremonial event intended to commemorate the immense impact of the relocation that has occurred in the 1960s. Starting in 1984, the event known as Remember the Removal Day was organized by the Kinzua Dam Issues Committee and the Remember the Removal Subcommittee of the Council. From 1935 to 1966, the Allegheny Council House served as the primary gathering place for government officials and the broader Seneca Nation community during two fundamental events in tribal history. At the Council House, the Seneca Nation organized the religion resistance to the construction of the Kinzua Dam in several ways from 1936 to 1966, ranging from legal actions to social activism. Although the nation was ultimately unable to prevent the United States government from building the Kinzua Dam, the controversial event mobilized the Senecas in their efforts to resist the taking of their land. Furthermore, Seneca women played an important role in the leadership at the Allegheny Council House beginning in 1935 when they first petitioned the council for the right to vote. Women's efforts during the fight to prevent the construction of the Kinzua Dam were particularly influential and ultimately convincing enough to finally grant them the right to vote in the Seneca Nation. Both the construction of the Kinzua Dam and the attainment of Seneca women's suffrage greatly impacted the future governmental, social, and cultural patterns of daily life on the Seneca Nation henceforth. As the primary lo location where both of these historic events and governmental meetings occurred, the Allegheny Council House is a rare surviving touchstone to, the, to this important era of Seneca Nation history. So I want to end this presentation by showing a short clip from the 1994 Seneca-produced documentary, Land of Our Ancestors. Narrated by George D. Heron, president of the Seneca Nation during the Kinzua Dam era, it draws heavily from historic footage during the era and tells a bit of this story in the Seneca's words. So bear with me. In the late 50s, the Army Corps of Engineers made up his mind that our land was less suited for the reservoir, for the great Kinzu man who protect the city of Pittsburgh from flooding. It started with Eisenhower and the massive public works projects he planned. But there was such a public uproar over having to flood one third of an Indian reservation, the dam was put on hold for a time. During his presidential campaign, John F. Kennedy promised that if he were elected, the status of Indian lands would not be changed during his administration. We took him at his word. But after his election, Kennedy gave the go-ahead for the dam. We fought it as hard as we could, but we were a small tribal government with very little money, going hit to hit with the U.S. Army, Congress, and the President of the United States. In a last-ditch effort to save our lands, we invited Arthur Morgan, a prominent hydraulic engineer, to come to the reservation and see if he could find an acceptable alternate site. I did that, 
and found not only that there were alternatives, but that the best of them were far superior to Tinsua for storing water, for use downriver, for storing water to prevent floods, for controlling floods in every respect, controlling much larger floods than Kinsua would control, and having values far beyond the Kinsua Dam in many respects. Still, the Corps of Engineers wouldn't budge. We fought the battle in all the courts, right up to the United States Supreme Court, and we lost. The Treaty of 1794 was broken. The core is unstoppable. I think everything is becoming so scarce because we're losing all the beautiful hills, all the wildflowers, and the herbs. All we seem to run into when you walk in here, well, say, accepted spots are the ones that your family and generations before used to go to, and you can find these big earth movers. You know how much they destroy. And I can't uh, ever accept the fact that this might be progress in any sense. We spoke the treaty and break anything now. Everything was free. We were free. Now we're just like white people now. White people can't do nothing on their own, they, they have to ask. And now down home, it's, I know it's mine, because the treaty wasn't broken.
home. I was contented. I was willing to be there forever. If I was witch, you know what I do to them? I make them so they realize how I feel about our homes. The white man is greedy, selfish, and he'll take anything you got in any way he can get it. So I'm gonna stop it there, but I think you get the. <laughs> So I'm happy to entertain questions about the nomination or the building. I have a question. Why would this rise to the level of a national nomination? It very well could. Um, I think a little bit more research in the actual nomination would be need, need to be done to be putting it into a larger national conversation of, of you know, sovereign Indian rights, um, other treaty violations. Um, you know, I certainly think it could be it's certainly, we've, we've identified it as significant at the local and the state level, but it certainly could fit into a larger national conversation. And is the Seneca Nation aware of that? Have, they had, have you had a conversation with them about that? We've discussed it. Um, it's, I mean, it's entirely their, their pro project, so. No, Jen, what we might do is um, look to NPS and see if there are other examples, especially the Western states. Yeah, there's sure. a lot more uh, nominations. I believe the nomination is a bit of context on other similar, con you know, controversies in, in one more section. Yeah. Although we hate to ask poor <laughs> Annie to do anything else. Yeah, I do want to mention that the nomination was written by Carrie Trainer and Annie Shentag. Um, Annie especially did a really fantastic job really putting the emotion that you see um, on paper, which is not an easy task to do in this kind of limited national register format, so. Well, and I so appreciate, <coughs> excuse me, I so appreciated just that, the opportunity to do this. And I, I wrote to myself, like, this is a very deeply compelling narrative about the power of place, a fairly unassuming building that has such a rich, um, heartbreaking, but critical story to tell. So I know we don't officially have to vote it, but I, I also deeply appreciate that the Seneca Nation allowed us to read it. Cause I, I, they were particularly uh, vocal right from the start that they really wanted the board to read it. They wanted comments. They wanted feedback. They they really wanted interaction on this one. Um, so I mean, like I said, I've been happy to provide that for over two years um, with them. Kristen, what I think we could do though is vote to write a letter of support, to send a letter of support from the board, or something like that, to keep her. If you want to do that, something like that, or. Thank you. Thank you. Just, it could be just a brief letter or something. Just some support for the Senecas. Don't, don't you think, Bob? I think, we, yeah, I think it would be a good thing to, to uh, draft and have a nice meeting. Um, um, any uh, other discussion about that? Since we've kind of you know, relates to, I was thinking of so, some of our other underrepresented groups that we haven't dealt with and or given this much attention to. And I thought we all saw the whole film and found it very moving, or Jen and Nancy and I saw the whole film and we found it very moving. Wayne, would you like to make the motion? That they're close to you, I think. Yeah, no, I, so. I don't think we really need a motion because we're not reviewing it. To write the letter. Oh, to write point. the letter, yes. Okay. Uh, I will second it. All in favor. I guess we can get a couple of them. You want to explain what you want to do? Yeah, well, Doug has done that consulting for the Senecas, so I think in, uh, in any situation, you should. Yeah, I did. Wait, was the idea for Dr. Wright the letter? Uh, no, I think, it, I think it has to come from, I think it's that's something that should be drafted by staff. Kath, we're going to look to you for some leadership. Okay, so. <laughs> well. Thank you. Uh,
Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. That, that was great. really yeah. a nice presentation. Good morning, I'm John Bonafidi. I'm director over at the technical services side of the house here. So I'm interloping um, into the National Register program, which I was in for 15 years, 15 years ago. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, uh, ho hopefully, probably, the last nomination I'll produce, um, which I've said before, but then they keep popping up. Uh, this is one of those projects, and because I know we're on a, a compressed time frame today, we're, I'm gonna go through it really quickly, but obviously the nomination was sent out most of you have probably read it or at least looked at the photographs, so uh, you're familiar probably with a, a lot of it. Uh, just by way of uh, a few images, the, uh, the nomination covers the entire uh, historic and really current boundary of uh, the area called Queemans Landing, which is a hamlet in the uh, eastern side of uh, Queemans, which is the uh, southernmost town in Albany County along the Hudson River. And uh, the nomination uh, is a local historian. It's one of the reasons I, I uh, offered to do this uh, 30 years ago for the community. And it's taken a while for all the stars to align for uh, uh, both my schedule, their schedule, timing, and, and lots of other reasons, but it's kind of nice to bring it to fruition now. It's nominated under criteria A, B, C, and D, uh, and criteria exceptions A and D for uh, religious property and cemeteries, of which uh, there are three cemeteries in this district of about a quarter of a square, a mi quarter square mile. Uh, we're, our period of significance is kind of interesting. We're 8500 BCE to 1967, uh, which is a, a pretty good span with uh, uh, a historic period, uh, post-European contact period beginning in 1673 and the architectural historic uh, components here running from 1700 to 1963. Uh, it's nominated in the areas of architecture, archaeology, both pre- and post-contact, commerce, community planning and development, uh, ethnic heritage, both black and European, uh, exploration and settlement and industry. Uh, there are 217 contributing resources, 183 contributing primary buildings, uh, only eight non-contributing primary buildings, all of those built outside of the period of significance, uh, and there's one mushroom-shaped swimming pool. Um, and if you haven't read the nomination, that's your Easter egg. Go find the rationale for that. Uh, we have 57 letters of support from the property owners. Uh, we have no letters of objection. And we have co-sponsorship from the Queemans uh, Neighborhood Association, the Queemans uh, Landing Heritage Society, and the, Ravine, the Queemans Ravina Historical Society, as well as they're all co-sponsoring the nomination. And that is the uh, Queemans Landing uh, Heritage, or Queemans Landing nomination. It was, uh, I uh, had the uh, pleasure of seeing it yesterday, and uh, it uh, is a really great historic district, and that Queeman's house is a absolute treasure of, of the state of New York, um, uh, a wonderful first period building, and apparently uh, uh, almost a lifelong, uh, career long anyway, preservation of uh, uh, effort of uh, John Stevens, the, the Dutch architectural historian, who, uh, whose work was uh, so praised by Abbott Old Cummings, <coughs> uh, um, a mentor of, of Michael's, and who we just lost last month, the great um, New England timber frame expert. And uh, it is, uh, I, I hope the Queen's House uh, gets recognition going forward to be a great state award candidate. Uh, and it was a tax act project, amazing. <laughs> this is all in one. Um, it also has a period of significance that begins at 8,500 BC, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually a very recent uh, discovery because the compliance project uh, literally is located you know, in the Bank of Powerball, basically. During this linear uh, testing standard, the shuttle testing for a sewer project, uh, they came down on the, uh, an arcade period site. Uh, which has both uh, 
perfectly intact archaic period point, uh, about 8,500 BC. Mm -hmm. A few centimeters above that, there is a, there was a larger scale of a lower point, uh, which is 3,000, so it's a 5,000 year difference. Mm -hmm. It's a really unique uh, clay beads, uh, clay artifacts, which uh, we're still trying to identify the type. Uh, about 30 inches down, so uh, during the writing of this, that second period, there was a second period of Tom, I think, made, made the motion, and if there are no further Aye. comments, Second. okay. Second. Great Second. seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, John. All right, I'm back again. <laughs> no rest for the weary. <laughs> All right. So this is the Delaware Avenue Baptist Church. It's a good locally significant example of the Romanesque revival style located in Buffalo, Erie County, New York. It's designed by prominent architect John H. Coxhead and constructed between 1894 and 95. And the church was built along one of the city's most fashionable and prominent late 19th century thoroughfares. As a good representative example of the Romanesque revival style, the building is being nominated under Criterion C in the area of architecture. The congregation was established in 1882 as an outgrowth of the Olivet Mission and initially worshiped in a brick, more modest brick church constructed at 595 Delaware Avenue. As early as the 1850s, when the street was extended northward from downtown, Buffalo, uh, Delaware Avenue was home to some of Buffalo's wealthiest and most prominent residents. This trend continued into the 1880s, while the area was increasingly subdivided and developed, aided by the development and expansion of Buffalo's streetcar system, which ran up Delaware Avenue in 1889 and was electrified beginning in 1892. The congregation in the Delaware Avenue neighborhood grew over the subsequent decade as more people were moving into this neighborhood, and in 1894, construction of a new and more substantial church building began. Architect and parishioner John H. Cox had designed the new facility, orienting its most prominent features to face onto Delaware Avenue. And in, uh, and in 1932, in celebration of the church's 50th anniversary, funds were raised to undertake some small remodeling and re renovations to the building, including the addition of a small kitchen and some updates primarily to the education spaces. So because of its location on a relatively narrow sort of urban lot, landlocked by its neighbors, um, it, the primary architectural articulation really occurs on the front or west elevation of the building with seeming, this seemingly impenetrable rock-faced Medina sandstone, um, prom these prominent corner towers, round-headed arches, these big round arches, um, the big rose window, and other features typical of the Romanesque revival style. Secondary elevations, less visible from the primary street, were rendered in red brick with sandstone accents, providing a more cost-effective and practical solution for the building. So you can sort of see there's like a literal line through the building. So this physical distinction on the exterior also marks an internal functional division within the building as the Medina sandstone portion at the west contains the primary worship areas while the brick area to the east contain educational and meeting areas in the building. Now we're also nominating this building under Criterion C in the area of art, primarily for its highly intact interior decoration in the main sanctuary space. Unlike many other urban churches, which underwent subsequent redecorating campaigns, the historic interior, interior stenciling and mosaic work is highly intact and is an excellent example of the type of decoration of church interiors that was typical in the late Victorian era. The work of New York City-based design firm j &R Lamb Company, the vast dome of the worship space is decorated with multicolored geometric bands and medallion-like ornaments accented with a ring of angels and touched with shimmering gold touch, uh, details. Crowned with a large center oculus, stained glass window with a geometric design at the top. It was hard to photograph. <laughs> uh, the space also features intricate mosaic tile work which covers the rostrum and seems to spill over the curved edge and onto the floor. The tile work with its colorful patterns and bands and flourishes accents the ornate back wall of the chancel area which opens into a spectacular baptistry with a sunken pool ringed by shell-topped exedra. So you can see it has this real, just a very opulent, a very tough space to photograph too because it's very small and kind of confined. And this is a view of the Sunday school area sort of at the, the back of the building. So the educational area was designed using the Akron plan and originally had a large two-story space between the second and third floors that accommodated 450 people with an upper gallery 
uh, with a typical sort of radiating rooms that could be separated by movable partitions. In 1932, as the Akron style Sunday school programs were sort of declining in popularity, a floor was actually inserted, creating two distinct spaces. And that was something I just kind of uncovered in the last couple of weeks looking at this building, trying to make sense out of why these spaces looked so odd. But once you take out the floor visually, then you really come to understand this as this big two-story Akron plan space. So. so this is the Delaware Avenue Baptist Church. Are there any questions on this? It was really a tough building to photograph. The space in the interior is just vast, and trying to kind of capture the, the decoration and the ornament was, was really a challenge. Okay, Doug, move it. Jay, do you want a second? So this is the Newberry Building, located on Main Street in Batavia in Genesee County. It's a locally significant example of the late 19th century commercial building that reflects the shifting commercial landscape in Batavia from small, independent, locally owned businesses to larger chain businesses. For more than a century, the building served as a primary anchor for Batavia's commercial Main Street, housing local companies from 1881 to 1929 and a branch of a national business from 1929 to 96. For its associations with the commercial development of Batavia, the Newberry Building is eligible under Criterion A in the area of commerce. Constructed for local by, by local craftsman George J. King in 1881 for the C.H. Turner and Son Company, the pro a prominent local furniture making and undertaking firm, the building contributed to the early commercial development of Main Street. The C.H. Turner and Son Company rented one storefront while occupying the other and using the upper floors for its furniture business. After t the Turner Sun Company sold its business in 1887, two other undertakers used the building until 1929. The J.J. Newberry Company, a national five and dime chain re retailer, bought the building in 1929 and remained there until 1996. So the building is local, additionally locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture for illustrating the changing commercial trends from the late 19th through early 20th century. The building was completed in 1881 and designed as an Italian two-part commercial block, a common commercial form on Main Street in Batavia and on commercial streets throughout the country. After the Newberry Company purchased the building, it was renovated twice during the early and mid 20th century as part of broad drives by the company to update branch locations across the country. Through these two redesign campaigns in 1929 and 1948-49, the J.J. Newberry Company opened up the first floor into a large single commercial space created commercial, uh, commercial offices on the upper floors and installed a plate glass storefront system which flooded the interior with more light. These modifications reflected chain store tactics of store renovation and along with other storefront renovations in the area helped transform the character of Batavia's Main Street according to the aesthetics of 20th century commercial culture. So I just want to note we do have an approved part one on this project as well as the a very enthusiastic letter of support from Jason Molinino, the city manager of the city of Batavia, and Larry D. Barnes, the Batavia city historian. So this is the Newberry building. Are there any questions on this? Chuck, would you like to make the motion? Okay. Uh, Paul? So this is the Lindy Air Products Factory. It's locally significant oxygen extraction plant located on Chandler Street in the Black Rock neighborhood of Buffalo. Opened in 1907 by the German-based Lindy Air Products Company, this facility in Buffalo was the first oxygen extraction facility in America and was later dubbed, quote, the birthplace of the oxygen industry in the United States. The laboratory in the Chandler Street plant served as the primary research facility for the company from 1923 until 1942. On site, the company produced pressurized oxygen for acetylene torches used in industrial welding and developed new methods of transporting liquid oxygen. I, I passed their truck still on the road. Uh, in addition, scientists involved in the Manhattan Project used laboratories in the Lindy Air Products Factory between 1942 and 1946. So the factory was built in phases from 1907 to 1959 with a majority of the building constructed by the Lindy Air Products Company between 1907 and 1948. From the street, it appeared as sort of separate buildings. However, the factory is actually a large C-shaped building and plan that is nearly fully enclosed, forming a central work yard. The footprint of the brick factory is approximately 300 feet by 275 feet in depth. It's almost an entire block. 
So the Lindy Air Products Factory is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of industry for its association with the Lindy Air Products Company. The company was the nation's first provider of purified oxygen, which, when used with acetylene, powered welding torches that were, torches that were critical to efficiently cut and join steel. In 1927, scientists at the Lindy Air Products Factory on Chandler Street developed the dry ox system, which provided unprecedented efficiency in liquid oxygen production, storage, and distribution. While the Lindy Air Products Company opened other Buffalo area facilities and factories in North New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Illinois, the Lindy Air Products Factory on Chandler Street was the first oxygen extraction plant in the United States, and it remained an important research facility for the company for decades. So we've de defined the period of significance here between 1907 and 1948, beginning with the initial construction of the building and ending with the last year that the Lindy Air Products Company utilized the factory. So this also corresponds, as you saw, to the majority of the architectural development. So here's a view inside that work yard with the Lindy chimney still visible and some interior views. It's a real maze of spaces. Um, so we do have an approved part one on this building, and currently the building is being redeveloped for use, as a tech, for use by a technology company, a beer bottling facility, and a winery. So this is the Lindy Air Products Factory. <laughs> Could the case be made that this is have national significance because of all the references? First of this, the we we looked at that. Um, I mean, it's possible. It would take a lot of scientific kind of understanding that um, was, I, th I think, maybe a little beyond the scope of this project. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of very technical information in the nomination as it is, and um, but I think it would really need some real scientific kind of discussion um, to, to understand exactly where that falls into into the production. So. And I have one other comment, which is really wearing my hat as the proxy representative of the New York State Council and New York's chair, Barbara Lee Dennis is your level. So um, you're doing Barbara Lee. I'm, I'm representing Barbara Lee um, because you wonderfully mentioned all these resources that helped in the um, survey of the Black Rock neighborhood. And so Preserve New York, which is so wonderfully run by the Preservation League, is actually a partnership with the New York State Council of New York. So I just wanted to use this forum for everyone to encourage you, if you mentioned Preserve New York grants, to please also reference the New York State Council of the Arts, which is a priority yes. of our chair. So, not to pick on you at all, Jennifer. <laughs> that was my platform. Hi, so, hi. so, thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. We just so, try so hard not to forget to mention Preserve right. New York that we sometimes forget to yeah. also well, mention. Well, she's really made, um, because NISCA supports a uh, number of free grant programs in all of she has made it a real platform to make sure that the Council of the Arts is acknowledged as a green grant partner starting this year. So I'm just very good point. Yeah, very good yeah. point. Not to take away from Aaron and Frank, who do a fabulous job and do the bulk of the work at the league. That's an excellent point. Everybody remember that. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, Kristen. And I, I will make an Okay, that's good. And, we have a second. Daryl seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so this is the First Baptist Church of Springville um, boundary expansion. The, the actual church was listed on the National Register in 2008 under Criterion C in the area of architecture and under Criterion A in the area of social history. The period of significance was defined beginning with the initial construction of the church around 1869 and closing in 1914 with the last major phase of alteration and updates made to the church. At the time of listing, the historically associated parsonage and its garage were accidentally omitted from the nomination because they had been sold and their connection to the church was not clearly understood at the time. So the amendment to the church nomination expands the boundary to include the two associated properties. The parsonage enhances the significance of the church building, uh, church building by representing the full history of the parish and fits within the general development era and period of significance defined in the original nomination. It complements the significance of the church as it supported its functions and activities. The garage, although non-contributing due to its age, has been associated with the parsonage since its construction. So according to the church records, the land at the southeast corner of North Buffalo Street and Franklin Street was purchased by the congregation after, uh, in 1868. At the time, it contained an existing house. Shortly after, the church was constructed in 1969, 1869 
and the house was used as a parsonage. In 1886, due to the rising maintenance costs of the older building, church records indicate that discussions were underway to build a new parsonage for the church. It was completed in 1887 at a cost of $1,400. A new spacious porch was added to the building in 1914, uh, which corresponds to other work going on at the church at the same time. So the building was used by the First, First Baptist Church continually from the 1880s until 2003 when it was sold off. At this time, the parsonage and garage were split off as a separate parcel and sold for private residential use. Presently, presently, Springville Center for the Arts, owner of the church and the sponsor of the original nomination in 2008, is in the process of acquiring the parsonage from the homeowner and seeks to utilize the building to support its operations. So we have a letter of support on this from the mayor of Springville, as well as the Historic Preservation Commission for this project. So this is the First Baptist Church of Springville boundary expansion. Are there any questions to this? Yeah, so uh, because this is a boundary expansion, the, I, in the form, there's no listing of the National Register criteria. Is it A and C? Correct. Um, yeah, it corresponds to the criteria. This, this is sort of additional information that's being supported to, to supplement the original nomination. Yeah. It's one contributing and one not. It's one contributing, yeah. The, the parsonage is contributing, and then the garage behind it is from the 80s, so. Greetings. Um, I'm bringing you this four nominations. The first is the Sagamore Apartment House in Syracuse. Syracuse is a certified local government. We have a letter of support from the Syracuse Landmark Preservation Board. Uh, this nomination was actually developed by Dean Biancavilla, uh, and it's for Client Housing Visions, which is planning to use the, the building as, as a shelter and housing for homeless women. It's nominated under two criteria, criteria A, social history, and criteria C, architecture. And it represents the growth of the urban middle class in early 20th century Syracuse and the development of new housing types to accommodate their needs. At the time, this, this neighborhood, which is on West Onondaga Street, was considered a very wealthy area. There were many expensive single family mansions but by the time that the, uh, the, this building was built in 1926, it was beginning to become, to beginning to, to transition. And there were now some apartment buildings that were being constructed and also buildings that were being converted into apartments. So if you look at this particular map here, which is a Sanborn map, you can see that this is the Calvert uh, Apartments. It's the neighboring building that was being turned into an apartment complex. Many of the people who were living there, however, were still upper middle class. They were people who had uh, transitioned out of larger houses into smaller, uh, smaller apartments so they could continue to maintain their connection with the community. Uh, we know the apartment was built on spec in 1926 by the Detroit Construction Company. And it was sold, completely rented, all 30 plus units the same year to Levi Mannheim. The builder also constructed the Roosevelt Apartments and the New Jefferson Clinton Hotel in Syracuse. And this pattern of spec building is similar to that in the Huntley, built, of Huntley Apartments, which was listed on the National Register in 2011. And that uh, was part of an apartment boom that was going on that had actually started around the turn of the century. 
By the end of the period of significance, the building illustrates changes in the demographics and the decline of this housing type with the movement of the middle class to suburbia in, uh, after World War II. So the neighborhood changed. The people who had been attracted to this apartment complex in the beginning moved out after World War II. The building continued to kind of struggle as an apartment complex through until the 1990s, and it's been vacant for the last 20 years. Uh, but the street remains a, a beautiful street, a broad, almost boulevard street, uh, with some exceptional housing stock on it, and, and this is part of the reason why the, the community is really behind the redevelopment of this particular property. Uh, the Criterion C architecture uh, issues are that the building is, was a popular building type that was constructed uh, in the 1920s, and you can see here that they were using 20s, 1920s sort of stylistic elements, but they were also, again, appealing to people to move in here who would own automobiles, for instance. That was highly uh, identified in the advertising for the site. Uh, they have this, this rather nice cast stone entrance. They have um, a decorative lintels, pa you know, panels above the lintels. They had urns on the top of the building. It was, it was really quite special in its time. Um, we know that they had a tra an active trolley line on West Onondaga Street, but the garage was, you know, was really a feature because it was it allowed the owners, uh, the apartment dwellers, to protect their automobiles under under, you know, cover in the back, and made it quite a um, a special place for them. Uh, and looking at the advertisements, I laughed because there was one advertisement that said, "Man with car will take you, you know, will help you visit this site." So clearly cars were seen to be part of this idea of upward mobility. Uh, this is just some of the pictures of the interiors of the building. Uh, as I say, it's been vacant for 20 years, uh, but it did have a lot of elements that were intended to target its middle class market. It had an elaborate and decorative entry. It had terrazzo marble and ceramic mosaic tile in the lobby. It had ceramic mosaic tile trim in the hallways and stairway entries, and the apartment thresholds were marble. So we have here kind of the layout, the typical layout of the, the building. There were, the service apartments were in the basement. There was an apartment for the superintendent, an apartment for staff. Uh, there were uh, people who were doing the maintenance, people who were also kind of maintaining the, the building in terms of cleanliness. And up on the upper floors, we had studios in the back and this wonderful little kind of bump out here that exists above the, the first floor, which became kind of special dining area, we think, for most people. We had Murphy beds in the walls, uh, and then one bedroom apartments here right behind the, the elevator, and two bedroom apartments in the front. So this is the uh, Sagamore apartment building, and I hope that it will be. She, she said that. Oh, she said that. I was struck that you've been vacant for as long as it has been, that it still has the urns on the, <laughs> on the top of the cornice. It is, and it also has um, it has concrete, uh, uh, well, cast stone uh, flower elements underneath the third floor, and those stayed up. I don't know how. <laughs> Uh, the next building I'm bringing is the first Lewis County Clerk's Office in Martinsburg, Lewis County. And we have a letter of support from the Lewis County Historical Society. The nomination was developed by Betty Lathan of the Martinsburg Historical Society. And a lot of the information on the building's use as a fire department building comes from Ed Ingersoll, who turned 99 years old yesterday. And as a treat, they gave him a copy of the nomination and they brought him up to see the building. Uh, so this is the, this building is locally significant under Criterion A for government and Criterion A for social history within the community and also Criterion C architecture. Uh, the, one of the things that's interesting about Martinsburg uh, is that it is kind of the counterpart to Lowville. And does anybody here know Lewis County at all? Uh, Lewis, Lewis County is, uh, the, the county seat is Lowville. It's a very small county. As most people say, it has more cows than it does have people. Um, 
Lowville is low, though that's not the reason for the name. It's along the Black River. Martinsburg is high. It's on a, on a hill as you come into the, to Lowville. They're only four miles apart. But right from the start in 1806, 1805, when the county was formed, there was a contention between these two communities. And this particular building is part of that contention on the siting of the county seat that started then in 1805 when Walter Martin kind of packed the committee that chose the county seat and they chose, uh, they chose Martinsburg. So this is the first county courthouse. It was built in 1812 and it's only a little ways of three buildings up from the county clerk's office which was built in 1847. And in between those two dates, there was this contention about should they keep the, the courthouse up there, should they move it to Lowville, which was becoming the larger community. And this was actually one of the, you might say, um, uh, moves in the chess game by which they maintained the county seat in, in uh, Martinsburg was to build this particular county clerk's office. So the rivalry continued from 1805 right up until um, 1864, when the, it was finally when the when the county clerk's office and courthouse were actually moved to Lowville. So this is our this is our little county clerk's office right down here. As I say, this is the county clerk's. This is the courthouse itself. Uh, after the county seat moved, the building retained its importance in the community as the brick building, and it was used as a law office. It also became a harness shop, a store. Uh, it's, this is a picture of the, the Rima store uh, in the turn of the century. And then it was acquired in the 1920s by the town of Martinsburg for its water commission and fire department. And at that time, <laughs> it's hard to believe, but they modified it to hold a fire truck. Um, <laughs> kind of an amazing thought. Um, and what they did was that they took out they left these lintels in, but they took out the wall below them, and you can see some multicolored brick here. Then that was actually knocked out, and they put a garage door in there, and they drove a fire truck into the building. And the, the community, Ed Ingersoll, was in fact responsible for, uh, was the first chief of the volunteer fire department, or the second chief of the volunteer fire department, and he helped modify a lot of the vehicles that they used as fire trucks, because they didn't have purpose-built fire trucks in those days. And that's how they managed to get them into the building. Later on, when they got real fire trucks, they had to build a new building that was large enough to accommodate them. And this building we, we kind of remained vacant again for another 20 years until it was bought, until it was leased by the Martinsburg Historical Society and renovated to reflect its, the history of the community. So this is our the building as it stands on the interior, just one room. Um, with the original desk, interestingly enough, that was used in the, by the county clerk uh, in, the, in the centerpiece of the room, and the, just the side walls with this very simple style. And what's interesting about it architecturally is that it's, very, it's like the original land office for the Martinsburg Land Company. Both of these buildings were brick, they were fireproof, and that's one of the reasons they built them out of brick was to, be, was to protect them from fire. Uh, they both face the road, they, they both have uh, prominent returns. This one is Greek Revival, the other one is Federal. So that's the mark. Well, I, I will move it because it, it's clear adaptive reuse began long before. <laughs> 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 I just want to make one uh, overarching comment because I felt like we had a theme this meeting, which was the fire theme, right? right. We got the fire truck, we have the fire, many fireproof buildings, yep. the fire truck. Yeah. It's just fire. a treat that it's I found it fire. this fire. Yeah. So sorry about that. I, I, I like this nomination form for the care that we went into describing the renovations and also the care that the local community went to to make those renovations replacements in kind. Mm -hmm. That's well done. Okay, second. All right. All in favor? Aye. And does a nine-year-old man. I have. Okay, my third nomination is Lady Tree Lodge, which is a, uh, on the upper Saranac Lake in Franklin County. And it was a nomination that was developed by the owner, Chris Cohen of Rye. And it's, uh, to me, an interesting new Adirondack camp type. It's a hotel cottage, but important in its own right as the summer home of, uh, of, of Governor um, Charles Evans Hughes. 
Uh, it's not as a result of the fact that it is this kind of new, rather hybrid type of building. It's not in the existing property nomination for, it's not been, uh, been nominated as part of the existing property nom nomination for Adirondack camps. So it's a little bit of a hybrid. It's a little different uh, than anything we've, we've actually dealt with before. And I want to just show these maps. This is, upper, this is the Upper Saranac Lake. Uh, we're talking about this little peninsula up here, which was the location of the Saranac Inn, originally called the Prospect House. And here you see it in more detail. Uh, this is the, the building that was that became the large Saranac Inn and, and burned, in, unfortunately, in 1978. And the Velo Cottage, or the Lady Tree Lodge, or the Rustic Cabin, or Lone Tree Cottage, as it was variously known, is this building right here. And it was, it was one of the first of the cottages built, and it was clearly set aside from the others. It's got its own road into it. It's quite a different, uh, has a different look from any of the other cottages that are on the property. And so we felt comfortable with the, the nominating it on its own. And this is a picture from the early 20th century, one of these rustic, one of these postcards, in which it has its other name, the Rustic Cottage, occupied by Governor Hughes at Saranac in Upper Saranac Lake. Uh, I think I mentioned in the nomination that this area became much more popular after the railroad reached it, and there was actually a station stop at Saranac Inn, and people could come here in their private railway cars and spend the summer. Uh, and so it became a, a, a much more popular and much more prestigious location uh, as the, at the turn of the century. So it's locally significant uh, under social history and recreation. Uh, it was built in 1896 as the Lone Star or Belo Cottage, and it served as, as uh, Belo's summer house until his death in 1901. And he is not very really well known in New York State, but he is extremely well known in Texas. He was the founder of the Dallas Morning News, and he set standards of journalistic um, accuracy and neutrality that were widely accepted into the mainstream press in the early 20th century. And uh, Oakes at the New York Times cited him as a, a model for the kind of newspaper that he wanted to create in New York City, one that was not highly partisan, one that was accurate, that really looked for accuracy in its reporting of the facts. So this was uh, Colonel Bilo, and he, as I say, he died in 1901. And the apartment, the, the, uh, the cabin continued, we believe, to be associated with the Bielo family. It's still known as the Bielo Cottage until his wife died in 1911. In between that period, Charles Evans Hughes rented it for two summers, in 1908 and 1909. And Hughes is known for being governor of New York State two terms, uh, served on the pre Supreme Court for six years as an associate justice, <coughs> ran for the presidency against President Woodrow Wilson, became US Secretary of State for President Harding, returned to private practice, but also served on the Permanent Court of Arbitration and as judge of the Permanent Court of International Justice for five years in the 1920s, and was appointed by President Hoover as the 11th Chief Justice of the Supreme Court from 1930 to 1941. So this is just at the very beginning of his, of his uh, political career that he was here at, uh, Lone, at the, uh, the now called Rustic Cabin. And this is his family, uh, his, his son, uh, his youngest child, his, his, his daughter, and his wife. And, and we're not sure who the other person is. It may have been a companion for his wife who came up as well. What we do know uh, from the newspaper reports, reports is that he, he actually ran the state from the building for uh, the, the months he was up here. He used the den as his office. He used the dining room as his clerk's office. Because this was associated with the inn, people would go and have their meals at the Saranac Inn. And we assume that that's probably where he put up some of the staff as well. Uh, Harrington Mills took over the Saranac Inn in after the period in which uh, Governor Hughes vacationed here. And he made it an even more important property so for about 20 years, we know that a variety of people stayed at the, the inn, including the Freeling Houses from New Jersey and other, other wealthy patrons. And in 1930s, the, it was again separated out as an independent property by Frederick Altimus, who was Mill's son-in-law. 
and a later manager of the inn. So the building is also being nominated for its architecture, and it's, it's really a lovely building, it's sited right on the lake, looking out, uh, and clearly has this fabulous screen as the, the dominant architectural feature. And it's a kind of rich blend of Adirondack elements mixed with a contemporary 19, late 19th century residential style on the interior. So the interior has what's really more of a four square floor plan with an attached service wing at the rear. And I think it reflects the owners, the original owners' expectations for domestic comfort. But the exterior really reflects the influence of William West Durant's 1877 Swiss chalet at Camp Pine Knot very much more developed in terms of the, the interest, intricacy of the screen. Uh, this also connects it possibly to architect William L. Coulter, who was a Saranac Lake architect and designer of other buildings with similar screens that are on the National Register and on the upper Saranac Lake in many cases. So Moss Ledge, which was developed in 1898, which is considered to be as earliest of the style of building, uh, Knollwood, 1899 to 1900, Eagle Island, Prospect Point, and there are a lot of others. But we don't have a, a clear record of association between the man and the building. And we know that he only arrived in Saranac, the spring in which this building was being constructed. So it's one of those, one of those quandaries that we really don't know what, what, whether or not he was responsible, although it looks exactly like his style. Uh, it's kind of interesting, there are two possible links. One is that we know that Coulter arrived with a job, as they put it. He was supervising construction of the Trudeau Institute's new admin building for his previous employer, Renwick, Aspinall and Renwick of New York City. And Coulter's mentor was Aspinall, and Aspinall was the cousin of Dr. Trudeau, who founded the TB sanatorium in, in Saranac. So he may have actually been associated with some projects that were that started before he arrived on the scene. And then secondly, the circumstances of the construction are that uh, the, the, the person who, who received the products was a man named Daniel Riddle, who was the superintendent at Saranac Lake. And he was also a TB, had had TB, and had been a patient of Dr. Trudeau's, and was the treasurer for Dr. Trudeau on this new admin building. So there may be a connection there that we haven't been able to tease out. So I mention it because everybody who sees this building says, ah, Coulter, but we can't say for sure. So this is its interior. As I say, the interior looks much more conventional, much more like a 19th century building, except that it's woody, and, um, and but it has a brick fireplace. It has this lovely um, stone fireplace, but these, these mantles have OG, man, OG um, elements to them. So it's really quite a blend. It's quite a different structure. So overall, its, it's history and its design uh, stamp Lady Tree Lodge as an unusual type of Gilded Age recreational property in its own right, and its association with one of the premier destinations in the Adirondacks, the Upper Saranac Lakes and Saranac Inn, make it significant in understanding the history of recreation in this part of, of northern New York State. So I give you the Lady Tree Lodge. I'm Tom, I believe, second. Hi. Hi. Um, no, I can I can stop now for lunch if, if there's any need. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next one. Um, my next one is. Uh, the Stillwater Mountain Fire Observation Tower, which is, uh, uh, is being added to meet the requirements of the multiple, multiple property listing for fire observation stations of the New York State Forest Preserve. And it's a project that was initiated by the Friends of the Stillwater Mountain Fire Tower. Uh, we have letters of support from uh, DEC, from, uh, from DEC, from the Lime Timber Company, which owns the land and from Peg Masters, who's the town of his web historian, and was very helpful in providing information. And what I, I just want to mention is that this restoration of this building, which took place last year, is really uh, an excellent example of a public-private nonprofit collaboration. Uh, New York State closed the Stillwater Mountain Fire Tower in 1988, but, but, me, but it 
it remained in quite good condition up until the, um, the turn of the century when it was identified as a possible candidate for rehabilitation. And in, 19, uh, in 2016, the, the Timberland, uh, Lime Timberlands, the owner and deck worked together with the friends to restore the tower and reopen it for public access. So it's really a very nice story. It's being heavily used. They expected a few, you know, a thousand people. They had 5,000 visitors last year and it only opened in July. So this is a, a really great building. I also want to acknowledge help from Stephen Engelhart from the Adirondack Architectural Heritage. And I just want to say it was my favorite site visit of the year because I got to climb up the mountain and climb the tower to do the, the nomination. So I want to just show a little map of what we have here. This is the parking area, which is a little bit, uh, is not where the, this is, the, the historic trail is here on, with this line. The, the current trail runs a little bit to the, to the west of it. This is the location of the observation, of the observer's cabin, which was built in 1966, which is also associated with the, the fire station. And this is the tower here. And on the summit, this is a kind of image of what we have for the elements. So we have, um, and this is, this is kind of more, this is underwhelming when you see it, but we have eye bolts from 1882 that were used by the Adirondack Survey, these X's. We have a hole, empty, underneath the, the building, um, and we have um, the, the, the tower itself. So that sounds uh, you know, a little odd. Why are we picking up on empty holes and little tiny, um, little dots here which were eye bolts. But the truth is it's significant at the local level under exploration because it was used by Verplank Ver Colvin in 1882 for his survey of the Adirondack Mountains. And it's also uh, uh, important at the state level under Criterion A for Conservation Recreation and Criterion C for Architecture because of its role as a fire tower, fire observation station, you know, intricately used as a, an effort to protect and improve the forests. So this is uh, the way in which uh, the Colvin survey operated. Colvin started on the east side of the Adirondacks, and he ran triangulation lines between the summits. And so these are all lines, line of sight connections between summits of the, uh, in the Adirondacks that allowed him to estimate heights and distances and the, and the basic topography of the area. And Stillwater Mountain is this little place right here. It's one of his one of his main triangulation points, and you can see that lines were run out in all of these different angles. Uh, it's not the highest summit; it's only about 2,200 uh, feet, but it was visible from all these other locations, and no one had actually understood that it was a triangulation site until this particular object was dug up in the backyard of a house in New Jersey by a guy who was testing out his new metal detector. And he found Station 77 on it and Verplank Colvin Adirondack Survey 1882. So he, he contacted the Colvin crew, which is a group of enthusiasts who were on the internet. He had showed them this, this thing and then people started to try and find out where it had come from. And they originally thought it came from the east because of the name Stillwater but indeed it came from here. And this map was only kind of discovered in the archives in the last year or so and recognized for its association. And then since then, we found this, this wonderful drawing in the Conservation Department archives, which shows the tower, and there the, it was held up by guy wire, that's where my eye bolts come from, and it had this spinning reflector on the top, and that spinning reflector was used to manage to to make those triangulation lines fit together. So it's, it's quite a wonderful object in it, it, to, to just have this, this little, this little piece of metal really leads to this other history. Now, when Colvin left Stillwater, he left the tower. The tower stood for a number of years and then it fell down. In uh, 18, 1906 and 1909, there were fires in the area and you can see that this has all been burned down here. Uh, the community decided that they would build a new tower. So they built themselves an observation tower um, to serve visitors who were coming to what was the Stillwater 
lake uh, reservoir area, the Beaver River flow, and we can see here the construction, the people who are, who are part of the construction crew, we actually know who built the tower. Um, and it is uh, a fairly short tower, and I say it's fairly short because several years later, 1912, they build the first fire tower. It's wooden, and it is on top of this little observation tower. And so they actually suck the observation tower into the, the first of the fire towers that was built by the state of New York for its fire prevention programs. In uh, 1919, uh, the state, in 1918, 1919, the state started to buy from the Air Motor Company of Chicago permanent metal fire towers that they erected in various mountains in the state. This is still watered here. Uh, we, it actually has the stencils on it showing how it arrived from Chicago. It went from Chicago to um, Woods Creek Station, from Woods Creek Station on the short line to Twitchell Creek, and then we believe it was hauled by horse this summer. And it was erected probably by the fire, uh, by the forest wardens in the summer of 1919. So over time, the fire department, the fire tower ceased to be as important for fire prevention because people started to use airplanes and became important as a recreational and educational facility in the Adirondacks. And the observers would tell people of, of what they were looking at if they climbed up the tower using this, this wonderful um, map table. Uh, you could cite the fires using this uh, device here. The building was actually cited so that it's, it's kind of off. Um, at the corners are northeast, north, southwest, and such with the, with the distances, um, making it easier for you to triangulate distances. And this is a hand, a reproduction of the hand-drawn uh, map that was used in the building and was still actually in very bad shape. It was there when they started the renovations a couple of years ago. So the, the, the current observation table is a reproduction um, of the original, but, and I believe it's probably the original is probably stored at Wanakina and it includes a copy, again, we had the original of the original panoramic map that was used for triangulating fires. And the last part of this nomination is the observer's cabin, built in 1966. There was an original one in the 1930s that, that was replaced. Uh, there were a number of these wonderful cabins that were built the model 1941. Uh, this one is, is still there with its woodshed and a privy, and the trail, and the day I was walking up, the trap delays were in bloom, and it was a lovely walk. So I give you the Stillwater Mountain Fire Fire Town. Really interesting. Yeah. Chuck, do you want to tell, tell us any more about that? Uh, well, I think, I think actually, the first I was here, I think most of almost all of them are now is almost five hours. Almost all? These these levels on the front, you know, a few out of the western part of the state, that would be around state forest lands or state park lands. Chuck, Chuck, you're making a motion. And J second, all in favor. Aye. Okay, we'll adjourn now for a half an hour for lunch. Yep. Syracuse on Hidaga territory, and I've recently picked it up. So that's why I'm presenting a building in Syracuse on Onondaga County. Um, this is the Morgan Dunn House, and located in Syracuse, as I said, the Morgan Dunn House is significant under Criterion C as an example of the work of prolific local architect Ward Wellington Ward, great name. And he's pictured here over his elevation drawing for the house. Um, the house also meets registra registration requirements for one or two family residences outlined in the National Register Multiple Property Document, Architecture of Ward Wellington Ward in Syracuse, New York, 1908-1932, which was NPS approved in 1996. <coughs> the owner of the building is the sponsor, and the SHPO received a letter of support from the Syracuse Landmark Board, Preservation Board, and as Emily said, Syracuse is a CLG. The building is also a commercial tax credit project and received its Part 1 HPCA approval in February of 2017. Part of the project includes removing the aluminum siding and restoring the exterior guided by Ward's original drawings. 
The interior is highly intact, retaining much of the historic fabric and many of the historic architectural features, including a fireplace decorated with Mercer Moravian pottery tiles. The period of significance covers the construction of the house 1911 to 1914. And the house was built for Morgan A. Dunn and his wife Helen, who were active in the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Syracuse, and with several business and musical groups outside of the parish. Dunn was also a treasurer and a trustee of the Roman Catholic Diocese. The nomination document describes the building in detail and how the neighborhood was part of a prime residential area known as University Hill. Houses built in the area were largely for upper, upper middle class patrons, some being architect design like the Dunn House, which is now being added to the MPDF. Um, any questions or comments about this particular? Questions? Uh, we have a motion. Jay makes the motion. And uh, we have two seconds. Uh, <laughs> Kristen, I was first. All in favor? Kristen. Kristen? Kristen? Kristen. 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 You're the second. Yes. Douglas. Douglas, sir. You're the first second. He's the third. third. <laughs> That's the third. Aye. Oh. Aye. Move on. All right. The city of Auburn is also a CLG and supports the nomination for the West High School. It's being nominated under Criterion A for fostering the role of vocational education in the Auburn public schools and for participating in the federal VEND program during World War II to train adult war industry workers. The property is also being nominated for architecture, Criterion C as an intact example of a late depression era art deco school built in 1938 and designed by local architect Wallace Beardsley. The period of significance for West High School is 1938 to 1945. Built with economy in mind, the exterior decorative features were limited to the prominent elevations and the clock tower. Of particular interest is the mural over the east elevation depicting labor, education, and what the nomination document stated as moral guidance. The bas reliefs are all depictions of various educational disciplines, and all these are detailed in the nomination document as well. The building was a middle school from 1970 to 2011, and these images from 2015 show that other than drop ceilings, the interior was much as it was when it opened in 1938. It retains the original floors, doors, wall surfaces, the tile, and the interiors of both the auditorium and the gymnasium. The floor by the main entrance door still features the original tile mosaic map of Cayuga County. I'm sorry, I don't have an image of that here. Plans are to convert the space into housing using commercial tax credits, and the project re received conditional Part 2 approval in November 2016. Our technical unit continues to work with the consultants on this project. Um, any questions or comments about West High School? No. Virginia, I'll, I'll move it, but uh, since Auburn's now part of your district, would you look into what happened to the uh, nomination that was before us and then was withdrawn about five years ago for the gates to the Auburn uh, State uh, penitentiary, the most important in terms of the uh, penitentiary system that was developed there. It's been work going on at Auburn Correctional Facility, so. It's the, the, you know, the Auburn system was the dominant system in the United States in, through the second half of the 19th century. And it all begins in this town, and we should have something to, mm -hmm. to uh, it came before physically commemorate. It came before us, Bob? Yeah, it came. Uh, in fact, I, I think I still have it. Uh, the gates came before us, and, and then they were pulled, and we never, I never heard why they were pulled. And I know we've determined that the correctional facility, the historic part, is, is eligible for listing, but I, I'll look into it. I'll, I'll see what I can find. You, work, wasn't, you didn't work on it? I don't know Robert, I are you going through your files? <laughs> 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 yeah, I was, I was uh, just uh, long interest in, in, uh, uh -huh, in uh, uh, prison yeah, architecture. I don't know anything about it either. Well, it was a, a thesis topic. 
Okay, we need a second. Okay, I think that's Daryl. Yes, it is. And okay. all in favor? Aye. Aye. This may not be as spectacular as the Delaware Avenue Baptist Church, but it's a great little church. Um, significant under Criterion C and Criterion Consideration A for its architecture, the St. Matthew's Episcopal Church property in Horseheads contains two buildings built nearly a century apart and serving as excellent examples of modest period style designs well suited to the church. This also nicely bookends the period of significance from 1866 to 1965. The 1866 Gothic Revival style church was determined as meeting registration requirements for Masonry Gothic Revival churches in the multiple property document Historic Churches of the Episcopal Diocese of Central New York, also approved by the National Park Service in 1996. And that basically states that it has to retain its form, its basic construction material and period features, which this church does. The building's appearance as much as it was from 1890, after the steeple was removed due to structural issues. There's the steeple, and that's what it became. And I personally think it had kind of improved the appearance, but that's just me talking. Anyway. <laughs> The other building on the property is the 1965 Parish House of concrete construction faced with brick to complement the church. Being located at the edge of a large residential area, the building follows the familiar, familiar form of a raised ranch. And I've got a better view of it you know, later on. The sanctuary was redecorated more than once, with the latest being the new carpeting in the 1980s. And as you read in the nomination, that's all in there. The chancel is the focus of the interior being set into an arch. The historic image of the chancel was taken around 1895, and of particular interest are the ceiling beams and brackets, chestnut wainscoting and Gothic arch windows and doors. The lower right image is one of the extant 19th century windows, which is now located in the sacristy. And as stated in the document, the current stained glass windows for the sanctuary date from the 1970s. By the 1960s, the church needed additional space for its growing youth program, and they acquired the adjacent north property and began a capital campaign to build a parish house. The design for the building was a collaborative effort between the 1960s congregation and the builder. And I say 1960s congregation because the original 1860s congregation also collaborated with the builders on the design for the Gothic Revival Church. When the parish house opened, it had sufficient room for classrooms, offices, and a large multi-purpose room in the north end, now known as Judson Hall. That's on the lower, lower right. The building is largely intact, with the only major change being a new wood floor in the upper story and Judson Hall. St. Matthew's, of course, heads. Questions, comments, Mike? Could you clarify when the steeple was removed? 18, around 1890. Paul, well, would you want to make the motion? Okay. And Jay, you want a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And finally, we have the um, Warren Benham House. Uh, this is noted in the order of presentation at the house of 5680 Seneca Point Road. In case you're wondering, what is this Warren Benham House? Um, the house was built around 1924 for Frank Warren and remodeled around 1960 after Walter Benham bought the property in 1957, making the period of significance circa 1924 to uh, circa 1960. The house is significant under Criterion A in the area of recreation for being part of Seneca Point's transition from the summer hotel and steamboat excursion trade to the development of, of seasonal private estates and vacation homes. And just to reiterate, as mentioned in the nomination, this is located at Seneca Point on Canandaigua Lake. The house is also significant for its architecture under Criterion C as a design by Boston-based architect James Stearns Lee, who had ties to this area, along with his own summer home at Seneca Point. 
Lee designed a house to be used as staff housing for Frank Warren's estate, which was across the road. The lower right shows the house as it appeared in 1928. And going from left to right, as this is one of the intricacies of the, the Lee design. Going from left to right, we have a barn. This is a garage. There's a little breezeway. And this is the main cottage, the east faces or the, the cottage that faces the lake. So you've got these sections here connected by this breezeway. And there's also a connector between the barn and the garage. There's a space up here for the chauffeur to live. And uh, this is soon to be where the handyman would live. And it isn't specifically stated, but um, after Frank Warren sold the estate property that he had um, in the 1940s, he died. His obituary said that he was out of his Seneca Point home. And this is the only property he was owning at the time. So his funeral must have been out of here. Okay. So he must have been living in the house. Okay. And here's the cottage here. This is what you see when you're on Seneca Point Road. And this is what you see when you go around the side of the house. Uh, now what uh, Benham did when he uh, bought the house was he enclosed the breezeway which was, ended up being this area here, and added a dormer window to provide light for a bathroom and also light into the, the <coughs> breezeway area. Okay. He left the barn at the north end unchanged, and in the east end or main cottage, he opened the first floor and added a half bath. Uh, he added dormer windows. Those were done much to match the, uh, the, the rest of the house get the lights or, or line here. Anyway, he did this in keeping with the Tudor Revival arts and crafts design of the house. And the image of the lower, on the lower right also shows its close proximity to the hillside. Might be a little hard to see, but here's the hill which goes right up. So he's literally building this house, kind of like the back of it looks right into the hillside. When Benham converted the garage, in, uh, he converted the garage into a common room, um, he added a fireplace, constructed a brick from a demolished local schoolhouse. He also had to add a little place here. This is where the, the fireplace is built into. He had to add a chimney. And as you can see, he made this little addition, follow the rest of the, the building with the sloping roof and the stucco exterior. And so here's your fireplace made out of the, the leftover, the salvage bricks from the demolished schoolhouse. And he also used additional brick to resurface the concrete floor in the, in the former garage. He turned this whole area into what the current owner calls a common room. Just some interior images, a bedroom and a dining area in the East Cottage. Um, that's this is the, in the East Cottage, there's, this is the East Cottage. This is the, the main cottage where the handyman first lived, okay, before Benham bought it and started doing his work. Okay. And this is another uh, room in, over the former garage, and this would have been where the, the chauffeur had his, his uh, quarters. It's hard to see, but there's built-in uh, bookshelves and things. Um, the built-ins, a lot of these were done by Walter Benham. Uh, mentioned in the nomination was the discovery of the original of some original sheetrock from the 1920s, which was found by the current owners during repairs to the building. The building was vacant for several years before they purchased it, um, and they're now in the process of repairing and restoring the building. They plan to use the homeowner tax credit for additional repairs to the main house and the commercial tax credit for the barn, which they would like to turn into rental property, because this is a prime summertime rental area. Okay. Questions? Comments? Virginia, I, the, um, I, I got curious about uh, James Stern's Lee, because there isn't much in uh, this nomination about the architect. And um, so I went online, and I didn't see much more than you have there. 107 Marlborough Street in, in the back bay of Boston. But this fellow's grandfather was um, president of Amherst. His father was a 
Harvard professor. I saw that he was uh, at a partner for a while, Eugene Nolte. I, I, I sense there's quite a bit more to this story. Um, yeah, and, uh, well, I, two suggestions. Before this goes to Washington, um, call Boston Landmark Commission. Um, uh, see what they might have. You, you might get lucky and find a, even a buyer. And the Mass Massachusetts Historical Commission. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think we should really touch the bases on this one. Good idea, Bob. <laughs> okay, so I, I moved it. Uh, Wayne will second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Good afternoon. Uh, so starting off here in New York City with um, Congregation Ohab Zedek. Uh, the Congregation Ohab Zedek building was completed in 1927, and it's historically significant under Criterion A in the areas of ethnic and social history as an early 20th century synagogue on Manhattan's Upper West Side. The traditionally Hungarian and strictly Orthodox congregation had been founded on the Lower East Side in 1872 and had previously built a synagogue in Harlem during the early 20th century. Um, this building is designed by architect Charles B. Myers, and it's additionally significant under Criterion C for its design, which combines Moorish-inspired ornament with Judaic motifs. Uh, this style of Moorish ornament became popular for use in synagogues during the 19th century as a more Eastern and theoretically more culturally appropriate style for Jewish buildings. Um, the grand entrance, the building's main feature, is set within successive layers of ornately decorated colonnettes and is surrounded by cast stone adorned with arabesque designs and Judaic symbols. The facade, which curves to match the entrance, also features narrow, slit-like windows reminiscent of an ancient Moorish fort fortress. And of course, the combination of the Moorish and Judaic ornament continues into the foyer, as well as into the synagogue. And in contrast with the more severe facade, the, the brightly lit sanctuary features these large stained glass windows, a rose window above the ark, and a stained glass cupola. Um, we have, I have quite a few photos of the, this space in the building. It's remarkable um, to share with you. And the, the building here doesn't perfectly reflect this story, but I thought it was interesting. Um, a little story from the nomination there. Uh, during the early 20th century, Ohab Zedek became well known for its cantors. And Joseph Rosenblatt, who served um, Ohab Zedek from 1912 to 1926, just before this building was completed, was, became known as one of the finest cantors in the world. He went on concert tours, he sang at Carnegie Hall, um, and of course he contributed to an increase in attendance at the synagogue. Um, and even though he was no longer their official cantor at the time, he did sing at the dedication of this building. And then next door is a, and part of the nomination is the uh, School and Community Center, which was planned to be completed at the same time as the synagogue, but it, its construction was delayed until 1939. And instead of building a new building as they'd initially planned, they uh, repurposed two former row houses that were next door, and they hired architect Herman Sohn to uh, unite them under a modern facade. And so the, the Beth Hillel Institute did operate there through the 1950s, and now the, the synagogue uses it for their offices, kitchen, and educational programs. Um, we do have a letter of support from New York City LPC, um, and as I'm sure you saw, the, the nomination was done by Tony Robbins, uh, and I thought it was a pretty, pretty good job. So that's the uh, Ohab Zedek. Okay, uh, Doug Musin, Tom Seconds, all in favor? Aye. Aye. On to Long Island. It's a very busy Long Island quarter for me. So here we have the Swan River Schoolhouse, the sweetest little building you ever did see. Um, it was built in 1858, and it's significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as an intact example of transitional Greek revival and Italian design as applied to the schoolhouse building type. The building has the rectangular form, gable roof, banks of windows, and open interior plan typical of the one-room schoolhouse type. But instead of avoiding decoration to save on costs, as you see in so many of these uh, one-room schoolhouses, either the district or local families decided to opt to dress the building up stylishly. 
So the, the waning Greek revival style, which may have been chosen for its allusion to democracy or to grander institutional buildings, is expressed on entranceways, framed by pilasters and supported by wooden entablatures. Cornice, um, there's also the cornice band and cornice returns. And these simple features contrast somewhat with the uh, building's ornate Italian bracketing along the roof line and above the entranceways. And by using these relatively inexpensive details, the local builder was able to have a fashionable update on the conservative design. Though we've all commented on how silly these, these brackets look on top of the pilasters. Whatever, it's, it's adorable, but it's sort of funny. Um, the schoolhouse is additionally significant under criterion A in the area of education as the first schoolhouse built to serve the hamlet of East Patchogue. The town of Brookhaven established the school district in 1857 to better serve the growing agricultural and mill community. Norton Robinson, a member of the family who owned the sawmill on Swan Creek, purchased the small lot and donated it to the district for the school. And the building continued to serve as a one-room schoolhouse until it was closed and students were sent to newer schools in 1936. The desks are original to the school. Um, they were purchased from the Chicago-based A.H. Andrews Company and installed in the late 1870s. Um, so after a period of being used as a bus shelter, the school was sold to the town of Brookhaven in 1962 um, and became a small museum, and the Greater Patchogue Historical Society has operated it since the 1980s. Uh, this was a, a draft written by a Columbia student working with the Historical Society. And we do have letters of support from the Greater Patchogue Chamber of Commerce, the Patchogue Bedford School District Superintendent. Um, they still have a very close connection with the Historical Society. And uh, Focus each pa East Patchogue, which is a local civic association. So everybody's very excited about this project down there. That's one of those we call it criterion C for cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and onward uh, to the second in Ostrander Historic District. Now this one's been a few years in the making, and this is a companion district to the Riverhead Main Street Historic District uh, just to the south, which Virginia listed in 2012. So the, the second in Ostrander Historic District is significant under criterion A in the areas of community development, planning, and social history. And the neighborhood was downtown Riverhead's primary residential neighborhood for much of the 19th and early 20th centuries and, was support, and supported the nearby commercial district that grew up along Main Street at the same time. This is an 1858 map, um, which you can see the relationship with, between both areas. So here's Main Street and our district comes a little bit like this. Um, a lot of the area behind Main Street now is parking lot, but sort of capturing the, the early growth of the neighborhood there in that map. The history of the district offers a clear picture of how the primary market town and seat of the predominantly agricultural county developed, functioned, and prospered. And as the residents of the area included merchants, lawyers, as well as craftsmen and laborers, the buildings in the district provide a visual and historical window into the social history of the town between the mid-19th and mid-20th centuries. The district is additionally significant under Criterion C for its collection of resources, which encompass the broad range of architectural styles popular during the period. The earliest buildings demonstrate Greek revival, Gothic revival, and vernacular features, and then fine examples of Italianate, Queen Anne, Shingle, Colonial Revival, Tudor, and Bungalow residences, as well as simple vernacular buildings followed. As the residential area grew essentially one building at a time, you get a really interesting mix of styles and periods of development all intermixed in the, in the streetscape. And the district is also notable for its combination of high style buildings, vernacular adaptations of popular styles, and simple vernacular homes in a relatively small and dense residential area. 
So the neighborhood's grandest homes are the ones closest to Main Street. And then as you go further north and closer to the railroad tracks and even north of the railroad tracks, you get a lot of these more modest homes. But they're still very much part of this community that was all living there and sort of had that relationship to Main Street. Ostrander Avenue was laid out on the east side of the neighborhood in the early 20th century and is the last major addition to the district. And I couldn't not show you this picture. It's just so, so perfect. Finally, there is a handful of uh, institutional buildings in the district from the late 1920s, early 1930s. Um, we've got the post office here in the upper left, which is already listed uh, from 1935. The firehouse, 1931, and then the Odd Fellows Lodge and Town Hall from 1928. And the firehouse is actually going to be coming in as a tax credit project. Um, it's been closed for some time, and so the they've been wanting to put in a brewery there, and I think they've done a little bit of work in keeping their fingers crossed that this district will go through. Um, and we've gotten a lot of support from people within the neighborhood. They're really excited about the district. It's already a local historic landmark district, um, and there's a lot of interest in using the tax credit. So uh, that is second in Ostrander. It's, uh, we have to, Jay makes the motion. I'll second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Nice to see a, a big district come in from Long Island. We so often have individual <coughs> uh, nominations, but not yeah. districts. And Richard Weinstein did a good job. He really did. I, I thought Richard did a really good job. Yeah. He's been a great force for President Weinstein. Yeah. 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 Ye
and it's representative of the greater fireproof movement impacting American buildings at the turn of the 20th century. Hollow clay tiles were invented during the 1850s as a fireproof alternative to traditional masonry and became particularly popular during the early 20th century. Established in 1889, the National Fireproofing Company grew to prominence through the development of a fireproof hollow tile construction system for skyscrapers. The tile's consistent size and shape helped, helped save construction time and labor, and were as durable and fire retardant as stone, but less expensive to produce. However, the heights masonry skyscrapers could grow to were limited by safety and code regulations. Facing competition by steel companies, Natco began to focus on the residential market during the early decades of the 20th century. Natco's residential design competitions and direct advertisements to builders appealed to Allen and George Height, two brothers in Brooklyn. The house is additionally locally significant under Criterion A in the area of community planning and development for its association with Allen and George Height's development of Natco Homes in Massapequa. A quiet rural area with a small resort center, Massapequa remained largely undeveloped into the early 20th century. Anticipating increased resort and residential development, the Height brothers purchased a 3,000 acre parcel in Massapequa in 1905. They laid out roads, installed utilities, and from 1910 to 1913 began building a residential development entirely made of homes constructed from Natco tile. And while they planned to build about 40 homes, only a dozen were completed before the development was halted by legal and financial challenges. Effectively, they hadn't thought through it quite as well as they should have, and the mortgage um, on their land was held on the entire property, regardless of any subdivisions that they'd made afterward. And so this map really does capture the extent of what they'd done. When the homeowner first approached us, we thought, oh, you have a district, but they were building on corners because they're trying to make the largest, most impressive homes first. And so if you try to create a district now, you're really bringing in a whole lot of later development that's not part of the story. So then we thought, well, maybe your best approach is to do a multiple property nomination and tie all these together. Um, the opportunity came up for a Columbia student to work on the, the nomination. I said, go ahead and let's, let's write this up as one. We don't have any express interest from other homeowners with natural homes in the neighborhood. Um, so the thought was to move forward with this as a single nomination, and if we hear from other owners, then we will do the MPDF um, and make it easier to pull the others in. But just for the sake of, of this one, that's the approach we decided to take. So these are a few of the other examples. I have pictures of every home, but that gives you a flavor. Um, and this is the, the home that we're focusing on here today. Uh, so, although the development project ultimately failed, the neighborhood is scattered with these impressive homes and does reflect the Heights' vision for an innovative, attractive, seasonal, and year-round community in Massapequa. And this house is the last one that they built, uh, speculatively, like all the rest, and it quite literally represents the final days of that vision that they had for this community. Um, I have one picture of some of the interior there. Um, pretty modest building. Uh, this guy, I think he sort of stumbled on the history of his house and was very excited to dig in and do a lot of research, so he's, he's been excited about this project. Jennifer, what, what is missing here is the entire context of the planned community happening on Long Island after the uh, East River Tunnels were built in 1910, finally connecting the Long Island Railroad to Manhattan, to Penn Station, and this, and this was due to the Pennsylvania Railroad uh, coming in, building the Great Station, and buying the Long Island. I live in a 1913 Natco tile house in Cold Spring Harbor with a red tile roof that looks just like this. And uh, Natco, uh, I can, uh, this is all um, discussed in the introduction uh, to a book that uh, Virginia and I contributed to uh, that Norton published a couple two years ago uh, called Gardens of Eden, Long Island's Early 20th Century Planned Communities. Um, and uh, the Natco company uh, actually had a booth at this annual fair in New York, uh, where uh, a house fair where all the planned communities were represented. 
And so you see um, there are lots of these plant communities um, that are predominantly um, NAPCO. And one, of course, with, with these kinds of blocks, uh, about all you could do with the exterior was stucco. <laughs> and, uh, hence the, the, you know, the, uh, you go, I mean, there's some towns like Long Beach, Long Beach, every roof, you know, with, with these incredible pictures of uh, color postcards of, of red tile roofs. And, and Long Beach even took the step of, of making the uh, roadways red brick. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, I, I, you know, I, I liked what I read here, but I think that it needs some, some the addition of some additional paragraphs tying it to this great phenomenon. And the, th this was the beginning of commuting. You know, the, 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 the statistics on the Long Island Railroad, uh, the number of, of uh, passengers per day before the 1910 tunnels and afterwards is just incredible geometric. Uh, and um, we actually looked at, at uh, we, we covered in quite a few of these communities, maybe two dozen in, in the book. We actually looked at this one and decided not to, to do it because it was a kind of failed community. Yeah. I, I live in a failed community too. We didn't do mine either. <laughs> but, uh, and it lacked some of the you know, circuitous <coughs> roads and the park medians that were uh, so characteristic of this. So I think this is a work in progress, but needs a little more work before it goes to Washington. Um, oh, I would be happy to work with you or work with students to, to get a little bit more in. Uh, very good. Virginia will, will lend you her book, maybe. Oh, they got a copy here. Yeah, they got a copy here. Okay. Because this comes from the homeowner, yeah. would you move it forward so that we can say to the homeowner, it, it was approved, but we're going to add to it? Would you agree with that? Or is that what you advise? Uh, I, I, that's fine I would with suggest me. that, yes. All right. Well, I, I will so, because move that would, it conditional okay. on. Uh, if you want, Bob, we can even send you the new draft. Yeah, but whatever. Yeah, um, it sounds like you have a lot of knowledge. I mean, sometimes it's hard when you're working between all the Oh, there's so many things. Yeah, 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 how do you, how, yeah, I, I can and totally it was also appreciate a student that. draft, too, so. Yeah, yeah. Kristen's from Long Island, so she's going to second. I'm second. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you live in the house. house. Oh, okay. all, all, in, field all in favor. <laughs> I, just want, I just want you all to know that the... Um, and that goes slogan was cool in summer, you know, these, these bricks at hollow places, yeah. and warm in winter. And it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> Strike that from the minutes. Uh, is this way you're going to get started doing the survey of NACO houses? Well, so, that so that was my question. Time. Are there any that are successful communities that have managed to be? Um, uh, a, uh, district. Thank you. Oh yeah, I mean there are there are some, there, you know, some of these plant communities. It, you know, with plant communi communities, it's always how well the covenants are policed. Mm -hmm. You know, typically when the builders pull out, they leave covenants. And if um, a homeowners association is established, that actually polices, uh, as was the case. Um, with, with a few of them, Forest Hill Gardens, for example, um, you have a good solution. Unfortunately, in some, in some cases, uh, that didn't happen, and particularly within the bounds of the city of New York, you know, because uh, many of the built these, these uh, communities later to have these controls, um, yeah, and even more controls, incorporated as incorporated villages. Yeah. And, uh, but you can't incorporate a village within um, the bounds of the city. So a tougher, a tougher go in Queens and in Brooklyn. Uh, but there are uh, some, there are some good stories. Douglas Manor um, is a, a good story, and, and so of course Forest Hills um, uh, is a good story. Where they were able to do the corner blocks and then do fill, fill in with all the same kind of yeah that that uh, I don't think I've seen quite no. before yeah that would be astounding if that mm -hmm. was yeah. Bob is NATCO found in other parts of the state or just Long Island? oh I imagine I believe oh, I that um, yeah. Yeah. yeah and under uh, yeah I think I think that probably a lot of different places I mean it was N stood for national so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Mm -hmm.
have one more. Um, and this is a pretty hopeful story to end on. I just saw him run out of the room. But this came in as a third party DOE to Dan McEnany in 2013. And the reason why is this sign that you can't really read, um, which was still there when I went on a site visit relatively recently, that says, under construction, new Nassau County Police Department, first precinct. So this is right next to the police department. They decided they needed a new building. And this looked like the perfect place to put it. And uh, the community and the local historical society rose up and squashed that one as quickly as they could. But it was a bit of a controversy. Well, now it's been a few years, and Nassau County has come around. They're supportive of this nomination, and they're working with the community to settle on a positive future for the building, um, some kind of combination of community center and historical space. Um, but they're still working on it. And they're sort of thinking about this idea of nomination as a potential avenue for grants. So they've come a long way since that sign was put up. So designed and constructed from 1899 to 1900, the George Sumner Kellogg House is significant under Criterion C as a good and actually the last remaining intact example of a Queen Anne style residence in Baldwin. Um, Civil War veteran George Sumner Kellogg purchased this lot on Merrick Road and commissioned architect Walter Halliday to build the house during the earliest months of Baldwin's first residential building boom. Encouraged and inspired by the creation of Nassau County a few months prior, Kellogg was among many private individuals and developers seeking to buy land and build houses, particularly into the communities closest to the border of Queens County. The Kellogg House was among the earliest commissions for Walter Halliday, a 22-year-old architect out of Jamaica, Queens. Halliday worked prolifically for middle-class clients designing homes in the Queen Anne and residential st revival styles in uh, Queens and Nassau counties and quickly became locally prominent. He worked for about a 10-year period really intensively. Um, this is the first thing I've found him associated with, but you see him being described, described as a locally <laughs> prominent architect just a couple years later. Um, and he, he goes away and does other things and comes back and, and practices later in his life. So his design for the house reflects the exuberance of the Queen Anne style through its use of an asymmetrical plan, irregular roof line, variety of materials and textures, and expansive porch. And he also carried the style into the interior, where it's particularly evident in the, um, this grand foyer and staircase. Um, this is the one like major thing that's missing in the house. This, uh, mantelpiece, but it's really remarkable how much survives here. Um, and there's stained glass, decorative woodwork, plaster moldings throughout. Uh, the house was used as a residence um, and later an antique store during the 20th century. Uh, and the interior is just really um, remarkable how much is there. So while it was among a number of grand new houses built on Baldwin's primary roads during the early 20th century, the rapid pace of development in Baldwin only increased. And grander homes from this early period um, have long since been lost, uh, torn down, and the land subdivided for new, new construction. And some of the more modest examples I could find that survive have been really substantially altered. So the Kellogg House is a rare, survival, rare survivor in Baldwin, and hopefully it has a bright future ahead. Um, we do have a letter of support from Assemblyman Brian Curran, uh, and we, we almost had some, some folks here in support of the thing today, but not quite. So that is the Kellogg House. Any questions? Code moves it. Wayne, you want a second? Sure. Okay. Second. All in favor? Aye. Good afternoon. I'm going to bring you the last but not least portion of our National Register uh, reviews for the day. Uh, I want to start with the Gumar Cemetery, uh, lo located in the town of Deer Park in Orange County in the Godefroy vicinity, being nominated in the areas of uh, ethnic heritage as well as exploration settlement. Uh, we've been reviewing a lot of cemeteries over the past probably year or so, a lot in the sort of romantic picturesque taste with manipulated landscapes. Um, cemeteries with the uh, diverse array of funerary art. Uh, this is very much not that cemetery. 
Uh, this is a uh, uh, what's called the Pioneer Knoll Cemetery, and it's believed to probably be the oldest place of interment used by Europeans in Orange County. Um, its reason for being is its uh, location at the center of the 1,200-acre Peen Pack Patent, great name, Peen Pack, Peen Pack Patent, which is part of what was called the Minisink Country, sort of on the other side of the Shangum Ridge, uh, which extends down and sort of separates Ulster and that part of Orange County. Uh, very early settlement, uh, the three principal families, the, the Gumars, uh, the Quadebecs, as well as the Swartouts. Uh, two of those three, of course, you can tell by their name, were of French Huguenot ancestry and part of the uh, very large uh, uh, population of French Huguenots, an estimated half a million that left France following the uh, revocation of the Edict of Nantes, wound up in New Rochelle and New Paltz. Uh, these two families wound up in Kingston and then eventually moved down to settle these lands. Uh, one conspicuous thing, and you probably noted it uh, in looking at the documentation, is even into the early 19th century, the crafting of the stones is really very rudimentary. And we don't know if this is accounted for by a lack of skilled stone cutters or a continuation of an existing tradition. Uh, but you'll notice these are, we sometimes say crude, that's not really the greatest word, but they're relatively crude markers. Um, the cemetery may have been in use as early as 1700. I think we've dated it to circa 1720. I think our earliest stone is actually 1713. Uh, so very early uh, settlement area cemetery and sort of the last touchstone uh, to this Peen Pack settlement, which, um, as I say, was very early for that part of the world and a long way from Kingston where one would need to go in the event of an emergency. Um, one of the earliest stones, you can't really make it out in the upper right, is uh, the stone of Benjamin Provost, which is uh, partially in, in the French language. Uh, really wonderful cemetery, very evocative place, and uh, as I say, a little bit different from the sorts of cemeteries we've been looking at. I also want to mention the slave component of the cemetery. Um, stones are still being discovered there. Um, even the 19th century accounts spoke to how sort of, uh, you know, it was being let go is basically what they were saying, that they, they should spend more time, you know, uh, researching the stones and the interments. We have six identified slave burials there as well, uh, members of the Gumar family. Household, I see one of them, Adam Gumar, in the uh, lower left, which is unusual, uh, undulating inscription, but really a remarkable resource and one of the, the things, you know, we, we see a lot of great stuff in the course of our work, but something that was really inspiring to see, especially given the early age of it, and that is the Gumar or the Pioneer Knoll or Peen Pat Patton Cemetery. Oh wow, yeah, you can still get glass bottle milk. <laughs> Probably, and you'll see uh, even in the nomination there are so many variations of the spelling of the name and its evolution, you know, from uh, the 18th and into the early 19th century. Those of you know, Cuttabackville in uh, Orange County is actually named for the Cuttabacks or what are the Cuttabacks? Tom, Tom moved it, and uh, I think it was a uh, uh, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Moving up into Columbia County, and I suspect a building that may be familiar to some of you, uh, the Crandall Theater, located in the village of Chatham in Columbia County, uh, designed by architect Lewis uh, uh, Wetmore, excuse me, uh, who at that time was based in Glens Falls and working in partnership with Milton Crandall, uh, who I suspect may have been in some way related uh, to Walter S. Crandall, who was really the big uh, backer of this theater and its construction. Uh, building is presently owned by the Chatham Film Club as it's been, I think, since 2010. Uh, in a moment, I want to introduce a, a guest, but uh, let's take a look through this building and talk about it. We had some terrific context that had been put together by the Chatham Film, film Club that really put the building in the context of local <laughs> film, uh, local theaters, and opera houses. Uh, it was built at a time of transition. When this building was completed and opened on Christmas Day in 1926, it was principally for vaudeville acts as well as what were called photo plays or silent films of some variety. Uh, within a year, 1927, the stage was extended and in 1929 it was retrofitted uh, for talkies or motion pictures with sound. So it's really right there on the cusp of this major transition in, uh, in entertainment locally. Uh, it's being nominated in the areas of architecture as well as entertainment and recreation. 
a few more views of it, described as Spanish Renaissance, sort of in a, I'd say, a vaguer sort of Mediterranean revival idiom. Uh, but in any event, that is the Crandall Theater. And I want to take this opportunity to introduce Annie Brody, who is the executive director of the film club, which does great things over in Chatham. Just for the theater and the theater and Tom as well. <laughs> I know. I know. That's <laughs> contributing to the nomination. contributing to Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for coming. Uh, over. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much of, of this time to really document this. And we learned a lot in the process as well. And uh, we now we engage with the preservation architect to see if we can finish the complete restoration. So this is all part of one more thing. Tonight, about what was it? 207? 209. 209. The man who basically loved this place like it was his own family died. And there was a big fear that, you know, that this was going to disappear. And you all did. And I continue to do it. Well, the community raised the money. It was really astounding. And what I love about this is. The enthusiasm and the stories that come out from people. This represents a time in our history, you know, in small town America, that is fat, fast, you know, going by the wayside. And those of us who have the experience and can continue to recall it are keeping that alive. And I, it's just testimony to see how you all respond. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Get every one of us. Get get everybody to become a member. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, and our last proposal for the day, the Oak Hill Historic District, uh, located in the town of Durham in Greene County. I, I don't usually prepare notes, but I, I prepared a little bit of notes just to go through some context with this. Uh, this was forwarded as a district in 2004. Um, there was opposition to the district, very vocal opposition. I wouldn't say it was widespread, but it was vocal. And the process was stopped. And at that point, we, uh, we call it cherry picking, I guess. We listed a number of individual buildings within the hamlet in order to move preservation forward. Um, last year, we were contacted by the Oak Hill Preservation Association asking if we would revisit the subject of the district. We asked them to show that there was considerable support locally. Uh, they organized a public meeting and they were also responsible for compiling the owner's names uh, as well as addresses for us in the process. Uh, Durham is also a CLG. We have letters of support uh, from both uh, William Carr Jr., who's the town supervisor, and Ken Maybe who is the head of the, uh, the Preservation Review Commission in Durham. Um, surprisingly, we only wound up with one letter of objection. Without going into detail, I will say we were expecting at least two. Um, that did not come to pass. And uh, letters of support, we actually have one from Chris Gibson's office from 2016. Chris Gibson is no longer the congressional rep. So that's pretty much the history. Um, Oak Hill, uh, located on Route 81, framed to the south by the northern Catskills and traversed by the Catskill Creek. Uh, surprisingly enough for where it was, became a center of manufacturing in the mid-19th century. Uh, the Empire Iron Foundry was big, as well as the Oak Hill Manufacturing Company. So out here, sort of in the rural hinterlands, uh, was really a major seat of manufacturing for Durham and for Greene County. What we essentially have is a collection of buildings that principally date from the second and third quarters of the 19th century, with some exceptions, of course, and this was in the period when industry was sort of at its, at its, uh, at its, at its peak. Um, one great building, if you don't know it, the lower left, the so-called Icicle House, a very unusual moment in romantic, picturesque architecture. And don't be under the cornice when one of those falls, I think, is the takeaway. A um, few buildings already listed, the Methodist Church in the upper right and the Trip House, circa 1830, and store from the 1880s on the lower right. Just moving through some representative buildings, uh, the Charles Pierce House in the upper left, which has some truly phenomenal and unusual uh, Greek Revival style uh, woodwork inside, uh, the formal, uh, former Episcopal Church, and we see just some other representative examples of sort of standard early to mid 19th century architectural forms. Uh, Oak Hill is being nominated in the areas of architecture, commerce, as well as exploration and settlement for its still somewhat intact collection of, of, of historic buildings stretching into the early 20th century. This fact has been disputed. I believe Bob, uh, our chairman, was through Oak Hill yesterday. I don't know if you saw things that concern you or if you felt the district was relatively strong. I very strong, very but I was glad I wasn't <laughs> yes, uh, we unfortunately, uh, as I say, the vocal critic um, um, resurfaced. Um, we had done our best really to try to engage with the individual and um, it, it got a little contentious towards the end. And um, the upshot is I think there really was very little opposition to this at this point. It was portrayed to us otherwise by critics of the district when in fact we wound up with one objection letter and that is the Oak Hill Historic District. So his objection, her objection, can you elaborate on the objection? It would be very difficult to, um, and I'd say it is not necessarily always uh, something that um, has to do with the National Register designation itself. It's other issues that deal with other individuals and personalities and... Um, it's not, maybe I can just say it now. It's not a person who objects to preserving history in any way. It's not like a... Uh, property rights issue. It's a person, a very bad-tempered person who has disputes with other people in the community and hates all of us. <laughs> and um, maybe that's just the most, it, it's not anything where this person disagrees that these properties should be preserved. In fact, owns a very yeah, wonderful house, house that has been preserved. It's more of a personal issue. Yeah, it's very hard to untangle it all. Without really getting into the dirty so part. Of the other half expected she would show up. She didn't. We're all very happy <laughs> about that. And maybe Billy can get this out of here tomorrow. <laughs> uh oh. We have six minutes. Going back, the trip.
building the, the yes. store. That store. In 1970, I can remember <laughs> that building was a mess, to say the least. But you look through the window in there, and there were counters, and there were still boxes of shoes from like the night, late mm -hmm. the 19th century, early 20th. It had been, you know, this was the 1970s. It looked like it had no one had been in there in 70 years. Wow. The other story, which is a true story. There was an antique dealer in East Cambridge, and she gave a, a lot of the collections that are at the State Museum in Albany. She was a notorious antique dealer. In fact, she took a woman who was dying in her bed, out of the bed, to get the bed. That's <laughs> the <laughs> Charlotte Pack long gone. You can talk about the dead after the corn, right? She she's, she's, she's got the mantle from Massapequa. Yeah. <laughs> she was from Old Hill. Oh. And she and Stanley were listening to the radio one night, and they were became terrified. And they said, the only place we can go and be safe is Oak Hill. They were listening to the war of the oh, world. God. And they took off Oak Hill. They figured they wouldn't get them to go. That is a true <laughs> She used to tell that story in the lines. And she actually felt the bad guys couldn't come to Oak Hill. Wow. Okay. Stanley and Charlotte Paddock. Lovely. Okay. So you've been there as well. <laughs> so you've been there as well. Oh, I loved it. I loved it. We used to, that, the similar to that, which is just the Greek, is uh, they moved from um, that area up to Cooperstown. <laughs> you know, and we used to come over, my great grandmother, <laughs> great grandmother had a place in Bontior Park, and we used to come over through to Wyndham, and then we come down Mount Pisgah, the back way, and that would come into Oak Hill. And really nothing really changed. It was a granary down there, and I don't know if that's gone or not. That was sort of a whisper. But that, there's some neat buildings there. But it wasn't an economic component. You know, there wasn't a lot of money there. It wasn't 1850. <laughs> yeah, there was an 1850. Uh, neat place. I think you, you're moving it, right? In memory of Charlotte, Stanley, in memory of Stanley, in memory of Stanley. second. All in favor? Aye. And uh, do, do, Kathy, you want to talk about yeah, your next we have two, Well, I have uh, two things to talk about. Uh, just briefly, I want to commend uh, Tom's uh, pride tie there. And I wanted to mention that um, the uh, oh, so Alice cool. Austin house, um, the resubmittal that we did with the additional information is up on the um, NPS webpage for, the, for Pride Month. And um, as part of the press release that Dan Keith is going to write for this meeting, he's going to announce the, the additional information for that um, because we didn't have a LGBT nomination for this meeting. And then second, and there are go going to be a what is it going to be, Dan? A press event at the at the Alice at Austin the Alice House um, on I'm next June twentieth. Next week. Are I'm we going. going? We, yeah. So my are going. going. Um, and then we want to talk about the meeting for next uh, time. And uh, the one consideration we have is that um, Nancy Herder is going to be presenting a nomination for an African American cemetery in Harlem. And she's got a bus of people who want to attend. So um, we want to take that into consideration. We can either have the, and we also might have three new people. Yes. Uh, so we want to take that into consideration. We can either have a meeting here out of convenience, or it needs to be somewhere in Hudson Valley to accommodate the people from Harlem. And Michael, what do you think about the new people for their first meeting? They'll go, they'll go wherever they'll go. Them. That's right. So uh, the, the <laughs> suggestions, the one suggestion I had, and we haven't checked with the site yet, was Phillips Manor, and that would be close for the Harlem people, and it also has a very good exhibit on slavery, and then Michael mentioned the Senate House. We just opened a new exhibit on uh, uh, Dutch culture in Kingston so at the either, Senate House. So either one of those, one of those would be um, acceptable to me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what's your feeling? So it's still on the 14th? Yep. Yes. September 14th. We have to, and we have to decide on, the, I mean, I have to check with the sites, have to decide by the time the letters go out for the CLGs, which, is, which would be July 14th. So, and I think both of those sites would be acceptable, okay. I think, but it's hard for the people who are well, the farthest. 
Yeah, I don't want to make the Westerners go too far, but well, it's not now. <laughs> it's a sort of a tradition that we go somewhere on no our September meeting. Some meeting but even. Also, if you want to stay here, that's fine with me as well. I don't have any objections to traveling. I don't, I, I don't object. I don't object. Well, in view of the fact that we're having an African American nomination, would you like to try for um, Phillips Manor? That's a fairly easy yeah. career. Yeah, I'll we'll try for that then. If not, I'll try for Senate yeah. House. We'll try that one first, and the yeah. fallback will be the Senate House okay. team. Terrific. Thank you. And, and then, then we're coming west. Yeah, that's right. And I think, um, You'll get I think Darwin D. Martin. Well, um, I do want to say that earlier today, Doug promised me if we went to the Martin House, we would be able to sit around the dining room table. <laughs> Yes. So, um, <laughs> definitely that's an option. Go ahead. So now we need a, uh, if we're done, we need a motion to adjourn. I motion that we adjourn. Um, all right. But I also thank everybody for all the work. This yeah. is, these are very good meetings. Great meeting today. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. So we, we have a second. And all in favor? Aye. Aye.